Thank you. Thank you, Michele. And thanks for the kind introduction and also, of course, for, for this invitation. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, I'm not sure. <laughs> And um, yeah, so I am, as uh, Michele mentioned, I've been working for, uh, during the last few years uh, at a couple of different United Nations uh, agencies and um, during the last uh, couple of years at the UN World Food Program uh, headquarters in Rome, where I've been focusing mostly on uh, predictive modeling uh, for uh, food security. So um, that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about during this one hour and a half that we have together. And um, you will see that I'm not going to uh, sort of address uh, COVID-19 um, very explicitly in my lecture. So it's really not a lecture about, um, yeah, uh, COVID-19, uh, which I know is the main uh, topic of the school, but what I'm going to give you is more uh, of an introduction to uh, modeling, data and modeling for food security, which is one of the global issues that was um, like heavily affected in any case by, by this pandemic. So um, a little bit of a, di a different uh, perspective, uh, probably. So uh, yeah, let's start uh, um, with um, uh, some definitions. So what exactly is food insecurity or food security? So um, th this is a broad concept um, that is somewhat related to hunger, undernourishment, but specifically food security is defined to exist when all people at all times have a physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. So it's about availability of food, of nutritious food, uh, and also um, for people to be able to access it. So having enough money to buy it, or in, in any case, to, to be able to, uh, to get uh, this food and eat it. So whenever these conditions are not met, we say that a specific population in a given area is food insecure. And just to give you a few numbers, the latest uh, global report on food crisis, which was released uh, a couple of months ago, uh, estimates that uh, there are uh, there were around 155 million acutely food insecure people uh, across the globe uh, in 2020. Most of them being in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, but as you can see also uh, uh, spread all around the world, Middle East, uh, South Asia, Central America, and also in Eastern Europe. And, um, and this estimate of 155 million is actually a 20 million increase from 2019. So we were, as we were saying earlier, uh, COVID-19 clearly had uh, quite an exacerbating effect uh, on this issue. And food insecurity, so when people don't have enough to eat also then leads to uh, undernourishment uh, and uh, the latest uh, state of food security and nutrition in the world which is a report that is published every year by uh, UN agencies uh, like FAO, World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, uh, WHO etc. So this was really just released uh, a couple of weeks ago and the latest estimate of the number of undernourished people around the globe uh, is now uh, 768 million, uh, like between 720 and eight, um, 811 million. And, uh, and this is uh, an, even, an even bigger increase. So it's over 100 million more than 2019. So uh, although like the, one of the sustainable development goal, uh, number two is like to end hunger by 2030, clearly we're uh, quite far away from that goal. And also during last year and uh, yeah, like things have actually uh, worsened. Uh, so in this context is uh, even more important to uh, be able yeah, to, to track these numbers and understand where we're going so that we can uh, do something about it, right? So um, this is just to give you a bit of an overview of what we're talking about, what the numbers are, and then the the way I've structured um, the the next, let's say, ninety or eighty-five minutes. Um, I will first tell you a little bit about how food security is, is quantitatively measured. Um, so, what are the indicators that are being defined? How the data is collected, etc. And then I'll move on to how. Uh, we can uh, make predictions of food insecurity when this data is not available. So uh, on the one end, how we can now cast, like get a picture of the current situation 
uh, in areas where frequent and up-to-date data is not currently available. And then on the other end, also how we can forecast the evolution of the situation in areas where we do collect data, but we also want to know how things are going to change uh, in the future. And um, I will I will stop a couple of times for questions uh, just to to make sure that yeah, like we everything is clear as we move forward. And then I'm also planning if time allows to, to do like a short break after the now casting uh, session just to, so uh, be patient like uh, if uh, uh, your attention span is <laughs> starting to uh, to go down, let me know. And uh, anyway, know that uh, uh, yeah, I will do a, a small break so we can uh, yeah, refresh. Um, so let's start uh, then I would say with the first part. So uh, how we measure food insecurity. So uh, food insecurity, yeah, it's like a sort of a broad concept. Uh, it has different dimensions to it, but there's uh, several indicators that have been developed uh, during the years by uh, the World Food Program, FIO, et cetera, all these uh, different humanitarian organizations and governments. And um, specifically, uh, the I would say the four uh, probably main indicators uh, that are uh, the most used uh, are the food consumption score, household dietary diversity score, reduced carbon starting index, household hunger scale. And as you can see, these are all household uh, level food consumption indicators. So the idea is that you me measure food consumption by uh, surveying uh, households and asking them questions to, to get a sense of uh, where they stand in terms of food security. So if they have access to food. Um, and, um, and so, in organization collect different kind of indicators to do surveys, but there have also been studies that uh, have, uh, have looked at uh, correlations between these different indicators and trying to understand uh, really what are the, if they capture different aspects, if we could use maybe just one as the most representative, et cetera. And specifically, uh, this study from Weitla and collaborators from a few years ago, they look at these four indicators and what they find, uh, like they, they find, like they look at data collected on these four indicators in different contexts. And what they find is that the first two really uh, what they capture is that the diversity of the dietary intake of households and the, the last two, they are uh, they capture more the consequences of uh, having constrained access to food, so not being able to uh, to access as much food as needed. And so, um, inspired also by this, what we will be focusing on during this uh, this lecture, also in the in the kind of uh, yeah, work that I've been carrying out during the last uh, few years is uh, really focusing on these two indicators. On the one end, the food consumption score, the FCS, and the other one, the reduced coping strategy index. Um, since they uh, they can be used as proxy indicators to, to capture these two main uh, dimensions of food insecurity. Um, so let's uh, let me define more in details than these two indicators. So the food consumption score, um, basically this is obtained by asking households, uh, so through these uh, surveys, uh, so how often during the last seven days have you eaten foods from different, uh, these different food groups, like main staples, pulses, fruits, vegetable, meat, milk, etc. Uh, so the, the frequency, like, is given like on a on a daily basis, so it's more like more than how often. It's like during how many days across the last seven days have you eaten this kind of food, and then through these answers, uh, the food consumption score is built as a weighted sum. So uh, each uh, here in this uh, formula, the x um, represents the um, the frequency of consumption of uh, a given. Food group. So I don't know, for example, if a household has eaten meat every single day during the last seven days, then X uh, of meat would be seven. And then W is the weight uh, of each food group. So basically the frequencies are summed up, uh, but a weight is unsigned where more nutritious food have higher weights than less nutritious ones. So for example, sugar uh, has a weight of uh, 0 0.5, uh, whereas meat um, would have a weight uh, of uh, two or three. Uh, and then, uh, so then 
this is how uh, this score is built and you can actually access the actual weight in the reference uh, here in this uh, um, publication by, uh, by WFP uh, from like uh, over 10 years ago when this one was defined. Um, and then once you have the food consumption score, there are thresholds uh, that are applied. So the food consumption score characterizes the dietary intake and diversity uh, of, of each household. And then um, through some thresholds that have been defined by uh, food security experts, you can uh, label uh, or assign a category to each household uh, saying to which food consumption group they uh, they belong. So they, if they have a very low FCS, like below 21, then they have poor food consumption. They're between 21 and 35, they have a borderline food consumption, so still not good. Whereas all households that have more than 35 in terms of food consumption score, they we can say that they have an acceptable diet and they are not households of concern. So this is uh, the first indicator. The, the reduced coping strategy in this, as we were saying, um, tries to capture instead what are the actions, the coping mechanisms that households uh, are um, need to put in place when they don't have enough food. So a similar question is asked. So again, during the last seven days, how often, like how many days did you have to rely on different uh, food-based coping strategies? So for example, having to uh, limit portion size, or reduce the number of meals, like maybe once eating once a day instead of twice or three times, uh, or maybe borrow food or money from, from family or friends. And, and again, here for each of these questions, uh, there is a severity weight, and then the RCSI is computed as a weighted sum uh, of the frequencies uh, of these coping strategies um, multiplied by their severity weight. And this is called reduced coping strategy index because the original coping strategy index uh, contains uh, even more questions than these five, but then with time, um, yeah, like it was uh, basically uh, decided and shown that these five uh, questions uh, capture most of, uh, yeah, like, uh, most of the dimensions that are uh, needed. So here we have these two, um, two indicators uh, and uh, uh, this is how uh, they are defined, uh, but they, and they, each of them really characterizes uh, specific households, right? Uh, then once we have this, um, like we will then see how this can be aggregated to get uh, yeah, like uh, an estimate for a given area. But first, uh, yeah, let me tell you a little bit about how this data uh, is collected. So I mentioned uh, surveys. This can be done through face-to-face -face assessments. This has been the, the classical way until um, yeah, maybe six years ago, uh, eight years ago, this was uh, the, the standard uh, way to proceed. So uh, enumerators would go in the field that there was like um, households were sampled and we would go there uh, face to face to, to ask all these questions. And there, in the, there are two kind of uh, surveys. One uh, is sort of the baseline. So something that is carried out once or twice a year in every country, uh, which is the comprehensive food security and vulnerability analysis. And then there is also other surveys which are quicker, shorter, which are done uh, at the onset of an emergency. So the emergency food security assessment, I know there's like a um, earthquake that it's a flood or something, and then you try to get a sense of the situation as quickly as possible so that you're then able to, uh, to provide resources where they're needed. And then uh, a few years ago, the NBAM project was launched, the Mobile Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping. And so this idea of uh, starting to, uh, to collect data also using technology and different modalities. So this, uh, this was ideated uh, during the West Africa Ebola outbreak back in uh, 2014. Uh, and the idea was that sometimes it's difficult, it's dangerous to, to go and perform surveys face to face, either because, yeah, there's like a pandemic, like we also seen uh, this year and last year, but also maybe because there's conflict, etc. So uh, uh, this tool was developed to try and uh, perform surveys through SMS or interactive voice response systems or uh, directly live calls, which is the, the most used modalities now, uh, nowadays. So uh, sort of the same surveys, but 
uh, through calling mobile phones. And of course, this poses some uh, questions around uh, representativity bias. Um, I, uh, there's a lot <laughs> we could deep dive in there. Uh, I'm not gonna um, do it uh, today, um, but um, there's a lot of interesting questions. And, uh, but also note that, yeah, like right now, uh, you only need like to have a dummy phone to be able to answer these calls and the surveys. Normally, there's some incentives that are given so that, um, and the idea is really that uh, nowadays, even in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, yeah, like the penetration of at least uh, mobile phone connectivity with uh, yeah, very low technology phones is high enough so that, that to permit to reach uh, uh, most areas, of course, not all, but uh, quite an extensive um, fraction of the, the, the population uh, also in this, uh, in this kind of countries. And um, so this, all these, uh, these efforts that I've mentioned, like right now, they mostly have been carried out uh, either once, twice a year, like or doing ad hoc surveys. But then uh, a couple of years ago, WFP was program uh, really started to, uh, to understand the value of collecting information in near real time. And so having uh, a continuous picture of the situation. And, um, and so they launched this uh, near real time for security monitoring systems, also called continuous monitoring, uh, first in Yemen and Syria and in the northeast of Nigeria back in 2018. Then this was expanded in Western Central Africa uh, the year after. And then, really, with COVID 19 last year, uh, 2020, there was a huge scale up because as we're saying, like this, this is done through mobile phone calls. So, so even if Mm, everyone was at home, even if it was dangerous to go around, etc. This could still be carried out. We had uh, local consenters making the calls. Sometimes the operators were actually working from their own homes and making the calls from their homes. So this could still be uh, something safe to do even within uh, that uh, this uh, very specific uh, situation. And so now there's uh, uh, WFP is collecting data on a daily basis across uh, 35 countries and collecting yeah, more than 2,500 um, surveys uh, per day. Now, with, as I was mentioning earlier, with all these surveys, we had an idea of uh, the status of a given household. But then, of course, the surveys are designed such as um, so that you have a representative number of households uh, within each area of interest. Uh, there are several methods to do it. There's um, random digit dialing until you reach enough uh, households in different areas of the country that you're interested in. There are uh, sometimes WFP in specific countries has access to uh, phone database, phone number databases, etc. So there's uh, different ways to do it. But the idea overall is that you collect enough uh, household data uh, in each region of, of each country. And with that, you can look, you can basically characterize each area, right? So going back to the two indicators, the food consumption score and the reduced coping strategy index, we have that uh, you can compute the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption by looking at the percentage, the share of households within a specific region that, uh, according to the food consumption score, they were labeled as having poor borderline food consumption. And so this is one error indicator. And the second one is uh, looking at the prevalence of people that are using crisis or above crisis food-based coping so that they have to uh, adopt these coping strategies. And uh, experts uh, have defined a threshold of 19. So basically 19 is a third of the maximum number that RCSI uh, can reach. And, uh, and so if your RCSI is greater than 19, recall the 19, it means that you are, uh, you are in crisis or, or above in, base, in terms of uh, um, uh, food-based food coping strategy. So these are the two indicators that we're gonna focus on uh, for the rest uh, of the talk. So, Maybe before I move to uh, to the predictive side of things, if there's any questions, since we're gonna basically 
uh, talk about these indicators a lot. I just want to make sure that everything is clear. And let me also see if I can see the chat <laughs> because I'm in full screen mode. Um, And Elisa, I can also check the chat for you. I mean, if uh, if there's a question coming, uh, just uh, yeah, for for all of for everyone, just feel free to use the chat, and then I can uh, also forward the question and in, 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 and then interrupt Elisa if, if it's uh, that's okay for you. If sure, sure. Interrupt for questions. Okay. okay. Great. So I take it that uh, I still, sorry, I still can't find the chat right now, but I uh, take it that I can continue then. Yeah, at least there are yeah, no questions on, on the chat. Okay, great. Thanks, Michele. Okay, so um, let's dive now into the, the predictive side of things. Um, so the first, the first research question that, uh, uh, that we posed uh, a couple of years ago is about uh, now casting, so about understanding the current situation. So uh, as I, I was uh, uh, showing you, like we back then we had started to uh, collect data in uh, in uh, on a regular basis in, in quite a few countries. In many others, there were surveys. There are still surveys going on uh, once or twice per year, uh, but. There are still many places where, uh, where we can't do this, either because of limitation in money or human resources. Uh, this information is key, but you can't possibly uh, basically survey the whole world uh, at all times, right? And so the, the first question that we're trying to, to address is, can we predict the food security situation in areas where up-to-date primary uh, information data is currently uh, not available? So can we develop uh, some sort of predictive model that can give us an estimate uh, of the situation? Um, so the way we the the, the content uh, of like what I'm going to present in the next few slides um, is uh, fully described in this uh, preprint uh, that we uh, recently um, put online on uh, Med Archive. So if you want to know more and uh, more details. Um, yeah, you can uh, find the information there. I will also share links later and the slides and everything, so um, you get a chance to, to find it. Um, how did we go about this, uh, this problem? Well, the first thing that we did was to try to understand what uh, the drivers of food insecurity are, right? Because if you want to understand uh, the food security situation in an area where you don't have this direct information, then maybe you can get a sense of what the situation is by looking at the status of the different uh, the different uh, predictors, like different drivers of uh, different aspects uh, of the socioeconomic situation that drive food insecurity, right? So um, the, the experts in the area, they identify three main uh, drivers. Um, the first one is conflict and physical insecurity, as you might expect. Let's think about Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, for example. Then uh, weather extremes um, are also uh, an important cause. So you could have things like both droughts, but also floods. They can uh, all influence uh, the food security situation because, of course, they have an effect on crops, etc. So food availability. And thirdly, uh, as one might expect, of course, also economic shocks. Um, there are, of course, other <laughs> drivers. This is not a complete list. Uh, there's, uh, for example, other natural disasters. So, for example, if an earthquake suddenly hits, of course, uh, th this will have a consequence. There's other things like animal uh, diseases, crop pests, uh, etc. And then, of course, finally, also health, uh, health uh, emergencies, health shocks. And, uh, um, and we knew this even yeah, before like the start of COVID-19, of course, like with Ebola, with everything that happened before, also cholera, other, other, any other kind of disease or uh, epidemics that might affect the situation. And um, you will see that we don't really take into account uh, COVID-19 explicitly in this work. Um, 
for there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, uh, the data that we are uh, using for for this uh, for this model is also uh, is in large part also prior to the onset of COVID nineteen. So we wanted to be able to to create a model that uh, that is uh, more generic and not specific only for this for this period. And then also what we realized when we started looking at the data as the pandemic hit, etc., is that uh, really these three drivers already indirectly take into account also that. So really the economic indicators were heavily affected. So like the, the, the influence that COVID-19 has had on, uh, on food security can be clearly seen, for example, in food prices. So in a sense, we're already taking uh, that into account, but in an indirect way. So starting from these uh, three drivers, we, uh, we combine diverse data sources to build uh, a database uh, from which we could uh, then create some uh, predictors, some input features for our model. So uh, we, we resorted to the ACLED data set, the ACLED project for conflict information. Basically, ACLED collects on a weekly basis um, information on conflict-related events and fatalities uh, from online sources. So there's, and then they also manually curate it. So there's a web scraping uh, part and then some manual curation from experts. Then in terms of economics, we used information on uh, market prices, which are uh, regularly collected uh, by WFP. Uh, and specifically, we looked at the, the prices of cereals and tubers uh, in local markets. Then also macroeconomic indicators such as inflation, online inflation, food inflation, currency exchange, and then also the latest um, estimates of uh, undernourishment. And then on the climate side, we, um, we resorted to indicators uh, taken from uh, derived from satellite imagery, art observation imagery, so uh, rainfall and uh, so how much it rained, uh, how green the uh, the land is, so vegetation index, and in both cases also uh, their anomalies. So how much? Uh, so right now, if it rained, uh, did it, is it raining more or less? Than, than usual in the same period. So we also have historical information and we can also know not only how much it's raining right now, but also if this is uh, above or below uh, what it's the normal or the average, long-term average amount of rain uh, that we have right now. And the same for, for the vegetation. So from all of these uh, different data, uh, we built uh, a set of features uh, for each of the uh, area and uh, the time frame for which we had an estimate of the, the prevalence of people with insufficient consumption, and also uh, for the other indicator, the, the prevalence of people using crisis or above crisis for best coping. So um, we had, uh, we're using the last available undernourishment estimate, the increase or decrease in conflict fatalities, rainfall, vegetation, their anomalies, zero plus variation, headline of inflation, uh, currency exchange, change. Um, and then also when available, we also look at the last estimate of the indicator that we want to predict. Um, and this is a little bit the, uh, these are the, the kind of indicators that we'll, we use to predict. And then the way we train the model is uh, through this, um, yeah, like, uh, quite comprehensive uh, data set that thanks to all the data that WFP, FAO, governments, et cetera, have been collecting during the years. Uh, so for the two indicators that I mentioned, uh, we have uh, almost 9,000 observations across 78 countries and 15 years for the, the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption and 7,000 for, uh, for the prevalence of people using crisis or above crisis food-based coping. And uh, uh, here I'm also, in parentheses, you see also the number of data points where you have a previous assessment. So not, uh, of course, we need to discard, uh, like if, so sometimes we, uh, we have a previous assessment available that we can use as input variable, sometimes we don't. So we will be different models to take that into account. Um, and uh, the, our model looks at, uh, um, training the model and predicting uh, 
estimates at the first level administrative unit uh, all around the world. So all the data is, uh, uh, is at that resolution. So that could be your, for example, regions in Italy or could be states in the US, et cetera. So depending on the country. So whatever is the first division that you have there. And because this is where uh, like the, the level of representation on, of our training data. And then also what we do is to build, uh, like our model is, is global. We don't distinguish. Uh, it's not like we build a model for each country. We just consider all the data together uh, and try to find patterns from there. So the approach, the modeling approach that we use is to use garden boosted decision tree ensembles, um, XGBoost, this is a, I think a well-known um, uh, library uh, for uh, yeah for um, for doing uh, machine learning and specifically in our case a regression problem. Um, and the idea is to have um, yeah it's it's a decision tree so where you you basically reach a result by uh, uh, a set of hierarchical choices and then instead of having only one tree uh, you have uh, an ensemble of trees. Um, so this could be also the same thing uh, when you when you have a random forest, for example, that's also the case. But then XGBoost, instead of training each tree uh, individu individually and independently, uh, basically uh, this graded boosting um, algorithm looks for trains uh, each tree iteratively and so tries to solve for the errors of the previous tree every time, so trying to, to get better and better. And um, uh, if you want to know more, I put there the, the reference to the original paper. This is a, an algorithm that has been used uh, widely in uh, a lot of the, it, it has shown to prove, uh, to work very well in a lot of the data challenges, the science challenges, for example, on Kaggle, et cetera. It has high flexibility. You can have uh, null values, et cetera. So for something that needs to, uh, to then, as we will see, to run in real time, etc. This is uh, this is a very powerful framework. Let's say. So, as I was saying, we what what we do is actually to build. We build four different models. So, uh, as you already know, we have two different indicators: the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption and the prevalence of people using prices or above prices food based coping. And then, for each of them, we actually build two different models. So we build a model where the uh, where as input variable we have the last measured prevalence. So it's like saying that we predict our uh, output variable at, at a given time, also by taking into account its value at the previous time. Although it's not always the same time. Like I don't know if we're predicting uh, for September, we might have uh, a survey from February or from the September before, etc. That that varies. Uh, and then we, so we want to use this information when it is available, but then we also build a model where this is not included as input variable. So that this model, we can use it in cases where uh, we want to predict for a given uh, country or a given area, and we don't have uh, a, um, a previous, uh, we don't know the information about how the food security situation was previously. So we have two different models, but like four in total, because two for each indicator. Uh, and then since it's very important also for us to take into account uncertainty, we actually, for each model, we actually build uh, an different bootstrap uh, version, uh, basically by resampling the data, the train data with a replacement, so that our final prediction are actually given by the median of this N, uh, N bootstrap model, and we can also give a confidence, uh, a confidence interval. Uh, the, the way we, we do it is pretty standard. We use 80% of our uh, training set for training and validation. When we do validation, basically what we want to do is to optimize the extreme boost the parameters. We do that to our fourfold cross validation. Um, ever we use a, a, a slightly ad hoc objective function. So we, we want to minimize the difference between our, uh, the R square uh, in the training and in the and in the validation set. So instead of just taking the, the model that maximizes the R square, we also want to look at uh, which model has the smallest difference. And this is because um, normally, even if you have uh, models with a very high R square, also in the validation set, 
if the training R square is much, much higher, normally this is a sign of overfitting. So we really wanted to, uh, to avoid that. And then the remaining 20% is used for testing. So the results I will show you in the next slides are based on this remaining 20%. And, um, and I'm not gonna deep dive into this here, but we also did some feature selection. So basically all those uh, indicators that I told you previously, we, we built like some uh, for each of the um, predictors, let's say each of the different areas, conflict, economic, weather, et cetera. We built a set of different indicators and then we, uh, we did some feature selection by uh, basically putting all the, all the features in the model and then starting to remove them uh, uh, and see basically which is the smallest set that uh, maximizes the R square and minimizes the, the mean absolute error that you, you can read more about that in the preprint. So let's, uh, let me show you also uh, a few results. Um, so here, uh, basically, I'm showing you uh, on the right, you have uh, simply a scatter plot. Of there, is the a, there, is, there is a question. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Rui asks, uh, how exactly did you do the feature selection? Okay, let me maybe, um, let's keep this for the end. Let's see how much time is, uh, is left. Sorry, just because uh, if I deep tap into that, yeah, it's gonna take me uh, quite a few minutes. Uh, so maybe we keep this question, if you don't mind, for, uh, yeah, for the end, uh, based on how much um, time we have left. Otherwise, I can uh, reach out like uh, reach out bilaterally later. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so here these are the the four models. You have the scatter plot, basically where we show the predicted value um, versus the 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 observed one. And uh, as you probably know, like if the prediction was perfect, you would have like all the data points basically uh, relying on the on the gray line, which is the identity line. Of course, this is not the case. Uh, all models come with uh, uh, um, with their uh, share of error. Um, and so the, the top two plots are the ones where you do have the previous prevalence, like the previous measured uh, prevalence uh, of, the, of the indicator uh, as input variable. And you can see uh, they perform um, better than the ones that do not include the independent variable, as one would expect. Um, so yeah, like the, the, the blue line is the best fit for the points, and so the closer the two lines are, the, the better the model uh, is performing, to simplify. Um, and here I also report the R-square and the mean absolute error for each of the model. And one thing that we did was also to compare the results to uh, to a naive model. So uh, the, um, the idea here is when we really, when we built the model that also includes the, the previous prevalence, uh, really wanted to understand, yes, but how much of, you know, like of the results is really explained by this previous value because one might uh, suspect that a lot of it is given by that. So we're, the naive model here on the table, where we have an R square of 0 0.39 for the food consumption and 42 for the food based coping, so quite uh, lower uh, than, than the actual R square of the model. That's where we basically um, we are assigned to the prediction. We take as predicted value the um, basically the, the value from the previous uh, the previous assessment. So we just assign it, we just say, okay, it's the same as last time. Uh, and you can see that, yeah, the, the R square is still is around 40%. So of course, a lot of information comes from that, but uh, the, the rest of the features clearly uh, give you quite some more information because uh, yeah, the, the, the R square of, of the other models is, is uh, much higher. Uh, so this is on the on the test data. Then what we um, what we also did was to uh, test the model on the data that we were uh, collecting in real time. So uh, basically, we we trained, to validated, and tested the model on data up to a, a certain uh, point in time. Uh, so data until the, the the beginning of this year. 
And then uh, with that model, we, uh, we also generated predictions. We generated predictions for countries where we are doing, uh, where WC is doing, is doing the continuous data collection. And so we here we in this picture we compare for April and May, um, March and April, sorry, uh, the two lines. So the the red line is what was coming in from the near real time monitoring systems, the data, and then the the blue line with the um, with the shaded area is the the, the prediction with this confidence interval, and then when you have where you have the dashed. A uh, line uh, that's uh, the um, that's the prevalence from the previous assessment. So it's a flat line because it's actually just one data point. It's just to let you know what was the last measured value, which so that that input variable that we also have in the model. And um, yeah, what we see basically is that in uh, uh, many cases uh, we have. Uh, predictions that are within the, the confidence interval, um, or at least not too far from it. Uh, we have also cases where we don't really hit uh, the right value. Here, for example, let's look at Benin or Burkina Faso. What we see is that our predictions are lower than the measured values, uh, but at the same time, uh, they they do a better job than just assuming that the situation has not changed since last time, which would be the, the dashed line. Uh, also, of course, also the data might be noisy. So I'm not saying that, of course, the prediction are better than the data, but let's just say that there is uncertainty in both. Here we don't really show the uncertainty in, in the data, um, in the survey data, but that's something that I think would be worth uh, exploring uh, further. Um, and then, yeah, there's cases like um, Syria where, yeah, clearly we are uh, far from the curve, but at the same time, uh, what the colors in the background represent is the different severity levels of food, uh, food insecurity. So basically when you, when you, are, when you have more than 40% of the population, which is food insecure, like in Syria, the current estimates are uh, like around 55%. Our model predicts over 40%. Uh, really at that point, uh, in terms of decision-making or like uh, yeah, understanding food security situation, although of course uh, the, the, the difference quantitatively is big, but really you don't, um, yeah, you, at that point, it's just so many people that you need to do something either way, let's say. Elisa, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, there are um, a few questions from okay. the chat. Uh, maybe, uh, Michael, sorry, if you don't mind, I, I, I have a couple of more slides on the results, and then I'm going to do that break for the question. Maybe we do that uh, then, or what do you think? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I also uh, now, I also see the chat, by the way, it has appeared. <laughs> so, so thank okay. you very much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let, let me maybe just uh, yeah I'll finish these few slides and then we can take the uh, the questions and the small break. Um, so this is on yeah on the near real time data. Uh, and then one thing that we uh, that was very important for us was also to explain this prediction. So this all of this was built really for uh, decision makers. Uh, officers at, at WFP to, to get a, yeah, like estimates of the situation. But of course, this model cannot be trusted if you also don't explain why, uh, why you get uh, what you get, basically, right? So uh, machine learning models are often seen as black boxes and so also not really trusted. So to do so, we, uh, we resorted to sharp values. Um, this is uh, a method developed in the last few years, which allows you basically to uh, explain your final prediction uh, from the uh, um, from an estimated value. So basically, your starting point, this um, uh, e of f of x, is uh, the um, the average value of uh, of your uh, of food insecurity, basically, of your indicator in uh, uh, in the original uh, in all your training data. So basically, on average, we have a 33.7 prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption across all our data. And then here we want to explain why, for 
Mali, we get this 48%. Started from there and then basically shop values allow you to uh, quantify the, um, the contribution of each variable, either like in a positive or negative uh, contribution and get to your final value. So you really, you get a sense like of what are the most important features. The features are, are um, uh, displayed from the most important to the least important, from top to bottom. Uh, and, and so you can get a sense of what it is, what are the predictors uh, that got you to that, uh, to that predict, uh, final prediction. Um, so this is the sort of the standard uh, waterfall plot for uh, using shop like the library. Um, we went, we tried to go a bit beyond that and also use shop values in a bit of a novel way to try to explain also changes. So our model is actually a static one, like we have a set of features and we predict an individual uh, point, like an, uh, a given point in time for a given area, right? Uh, but then by running uh, this model on a daily basis, and basically we had to, of course, build uh, a, a database where uh, that is uh, uh, every night it gets refreshed. So all these data sources that I mentioned, they come in through APIs on a daily basis, they get refreshed, etc. So on a, on a regular basis, you can rerun the prediction with the new data that has come in. And so this is what we get here on the left. Basically, this is an example from Lesotho. You get daily prediction by rerunning running the model every day. Um, and so you see that it's uh, it's a bit flat because what happens is that not really we have data sources actually that have different also time resolution. Uh, and so of course not everything changes on on a daily basis as also one might expect uh, in general. Uh, and so what we wanted to do is to then try and capture the changes in time. So looking, for example, here, what is it that has caused this increase from 42% at the beginning of March to 44%, uh, 43, 44% uh, in mid-April. Uh, and so to do so, we exploited uh, differences between uh, shop values. And, uh, and so we, um, uh, we developed this, this simple way to, uh, to show what are the, uh, the most uh, important predictors in the change. So not the most important prediction to get an individual prediction like here, but rather what, what are the features that have really caused the, the, the change from one day to the, uh, to the, the final day, right? Um, and so for example, in this case, we have that uh, the, the rainfall anomaly, the average rainfall anomaly has uh, decreased. So it was raining, basically beginning of March, it was raining more than usual. And then by the end of April, uh, it actually started raining way less than usual. So this is a, an indication that uh, things are, are, uh, might get worse. And then uh, food inflation, for example, was instead increasing. Uh, so also a bad sign, let's say. Uh, and so this method allows to, uh, to basically provide uh, the users of this model to, with, uh, with some estimate of why, why they see what they see. And of course, the, here I chose a relatively easy example. Let's say it's not always so straightforward. It's not a linear model, etc. So uh, you don't always get uh, easily interpretable explanations. This could be because the model has found patterns in the data that are not so easily explainable, or also, of course, uh, one also need to live with the fact that uh, uh, the model isn't perfect. We have uh, uh, quite some, we have errors, etc. So it could also sometimes be that we're not capturing it right. And this is also why this is important so that when you generate this prediction, decision makers know, uh, you know, like if they can trust them or not, if the explanation sort of makes sense or if maybe uh, it's better to do further investigations. And then, so the final step was to uh, operationalize this model. So um, this is something uh, that, uh, uh, this is a platform that we developed, uh, it's called Younger Map Live. It's a publicly available website, so anyone can access it. Uh, here's the link. Um, and yeah, this is what, uh, where, uh, what I presented 
uh, sort of lists on a daily basis. So the um, here uh, we give we provide a daily picture of the food security situation in terms of the two indicators. Uh, and in those 35 countries where we're doing daily data collection, we display uh, that data. And then in the other countries, we display estimates that come from the model that I just presented. So uh, here, for example, this Guinea Bissau, and here uh, you have different, uh, like each first level administrative unit, it's colored by the value of the predicted prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption, and, um, and which is given uh, basically uh, by the model. And then if you hover with the mouse, you get, uh, you get uh, uh, the predicted uh, number. So uh, last slide before the, the Q&A and the small break. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, let me yeah, go a bit deeper into all the challenges and limitations of, of the approach that we chose. So as we're saying, this is a global model and not a local approach. So um, of course, this has uh, some limitations. Um, if you build a local model, like a national one, uh, you might capture patterns in the data that are more specific that can capture better the local situation. But to do so, you need a lot, a lot of data for that country. And we do have countries where we have a lot, a lot of data, like for example, Yemen. But the problem is that those are not the countries where we are interested uh, in doing the now casting. So uh, Yemen, we keep collecting the data. And so it's really not, uh, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense for WFP to have a model that now casts the situation in a place where uh, you know, we uh, we collect all this data. So all of this approach, this globalized approach is due to the fact that we actually are more interested in making predictions for countries where we have less data. And so this also poses, of course, a question of representativity of the model and how do we build a model that is not uh, biased. So actually, I, I told you that we have around 7,000, 9,000 data points. We actually have many more than those because you know, those countries where we have been collecting data on a daily basis, we do have much more, but we didn't want to bias the model towards those countries. So what we did was to actually sample the data, not use all the data that we had so that we could have a relatively balanced uh, representation of the different countries. Of course, it's not at all 100% balanced, but so we tried to keep uh, as many data points as possible for the different countries, but try not to have too, too much uh, unbalanced, but also have enough data points to, to be able to train a model, a model. So we, in the younger map, we use this model to make predictions also for countries that are not really included in the, in the training data. And we know that this is uh, uh, not, let's say a best practice, but this is the best estimate that we have right now. But of course, this really needs to be uh, taken with uh, a pinch of salt. So uh, uh, the data that is like the, the areas that are not covered in the model, we can still make predictions because the, the data, like the model framework allows for it, but of course it needs to be used with caution. And then one of the challenges that we had is to find open data that is available on a global scale at the same geographical and temporary resolution. So, and also that is updated frequently. So as I said, we built this data lake with all these APIs uh, updating the data on a daily basis. So also when you think about additional features that could be included in the model, uh, this is also something that we need to keep in mind first. So are we gonna find data that covers the all the countries that we that the, the map the younger map covers and uh, is this data that is available and is being updated etc so that's one of the big challenges and also something that reduces a lot of our ability to include as much information as possible um, and then finally yeah that's just um, again a disclaimer that of course uh, all of these predictions are still at the early stages and they should be used with cautions and uh, and the, really the idea also for decision makers is more to, uh, to use this as an indication and uh, also see maybe where the model says that things are getting worse. And so when that's the case, basically trigger some in-depth uh, analysis, uh, data collection or something like that. So that, um, yeah, like a, a more complete picture of the situation can be, uh, uh, can be assessed. Okay. 
now. Time for yeah, the, the questions. Uh, okay, let me see. Again. You can see the chat again. Yeah. yeah, for some reason, someone. Oh, okay, okay, found it. Found it. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I was saying, yeah, the feature selection, maybe I'll keep it for later on. M uh, my M E A E, sorry, is the mean absolute error in the table. Oh, yeah, someone already replied. Sorry, I'm live uh, reading. Um, Someone asks, uh, just to make sure your naive model is basically OLS regression. Well, it's even less than that. It's really just saying uh, Y at time T equals Y at time T minus one, basically. Although that T minus one might vary. So it's very, very naive, basically. Um, yeah, someone already replied about the, what the, uh, the kind of modeling is. Uh, Last question is, uh, oh, how's the difference of R square of this extreme model compared to a linear model? Okay, we were not able to, to do this comparison. Um, and uh, the main reason is, as I was saying, uh, yeah, like the there were, so of course this, this kind of work was really done from an operational perspective, right? So there was a, a need, and WFP, you like we needed something to like a way to to make estimates, right, uh, in near real time for all the countries that uh, WFP was interested in, and uh, um, and so really, what we had to do is to try to build the best that we could that could work, uh, and so really XGBoost in this sense helped us a lot because, as I was saying, uh, it allows also for missing values. So the idea is that if you, like we have this global model, we are collecting all this data, but sometimes we do have missing values here and there, either um, for some areas, one of the features is not available or it's not available for some of the times uh, that we consider. So of course, uh, a better approach, a more scientific one would be to perform all sorts of data interpolation, uh, an extrapolation uh, and then have really a value for each for everything and then you could also perform a, for example a, a ordinary square um, regression model uh, but this was not the case for us also because this thing needs to run in real time so you don't really have uh, the possibility of doing this or at least like further work is, is required to, to go in that direction so XGBoost allowed us to to have a model that could also include uh, null values um, when uh, when they were not available. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I see there's more questions that are coming in. Uh, so you fit the two type of models. Can you explain the rationale between fitting these two type of models? Yes. So. Uh, on the younger map, as I was saying, we do predictions for different areas in different countries. So basically, we fit it to models so that for countries, I don't know, for example, South Sudan, we don't we don't collect data on a continuous basis in near real time, but there are surveys, face-to-face -face surveys that are performed twice a year, right? So we do have data, like first-hand data twice a year, but the rest of the year we want to um, I get a sense of the situation through our predictive model. So what we do is that there we use the model uh, that uh, that includes the previous prevalence as an input variable because we know this gives um, uh, better results. Of course, it's an extra information, a very important one. So in a country like South Sudan, that's the model that we deploy because we know that uh, that data is coming in twice a year. In other places where we still need to give some sort of estimates because the management, <laughs> let's say, yes. so we, uh, even if we don't have this, uh, uh, this previous prevalence, then we need to, to use the other model. So uh, we also fit the model where that information is not needed. We could have also just fitted only one model where we had all these nuns, uh, all these null values uh, for the previous prevalence, but that didn't seem like a very smart move. So yeah, we, we rather had two models and according to the, the country, 
the area where if we have that information, we use the model that includes that information, and if we don't, we use the, the other model. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the R squared, the contribution of including a previous measure is rather modest. Is it, this is not very surprising. Uh, I'm not sure what you're uh, referring to. Like if you, there's, it's actually like a 10, 10 or more percentage point difference. So when you do include the, the last measurement, it, it, it is higher because of course, that's a, a very, like you are basically, yeah, including uh, information of, of our very recent assessment. Um, okay, so someone is uh, following up on uh, previous question of would you know this is the best predictive model? This is the only one you used, of course. Yeah, I don't know it's the best. It's just what uh, we, uh, it's, it's a model. It's something we, uh, we, the best we can do uh, with all these constraints that we have, what we did was to compare with a naive approach and we see that it performs better, but of course, that's by no means <laughs> what we think the best uh, model that you can build. Um, mm -mm. Okay, I see there's uh, okay, quite a few more. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, yeah, I see we only have like around 20 minutes left. Uh, um, let me just quickly read through them. Uh, so on, there's a couple of questions, very technical. Uh, I would uh, probably just refer uh, both uh, Puria and Rui to, to the preprint uh, where you'll find the details on your question. And then um, going to maybe Stephanie's question, the last one. Um, yeah, we um, do you think about including textual data sentiment in order to predict food security? That's uh, that's something like the use of social media data. Uh, that's of course something that could be uh, very interesting. Uh, we haven't done so yet, uh, also because. Um, like the areas where we were basically we need to make predictions for most of them are not really uh, high they don't have high presentation of social media like Twitter, uh, Facebook, etc. And also uh, for some data like there is also this issue of global availability which for example Twitter would have but we could it could be explored further for example maybe uh, I don't know in areas like Latin America and uh, uh, Asia may be something that could definitely be uh, be looked into where yeah like there is higher penetration of this kind of of technology so yeah maybe future work uh, um, yeah is it hard to convince policymakers about using such data yes <laughs> indeed uh, and this is also why we keep uh, keep underlying the fact that this uh, this is an indication, an estimate, and it's um, it's something uh, that they can be used um, to, like, as the best as the best guess <laughs> that you will have without any primary data. Again, when I say best guess, I'm not saying that this is the best model you can get, but basically, if you don't have any data at all, at all, uh, then uh, you can start getting a sense from this. And what really is helping a lot. It's not implemented on the younger map yet, but uh, the, the all this work here on explaining, uh, you know, like with the sharp values, explaining how the prediction is done, how it ch why it changes over time. That's uh, that's really something that uh, that was needed to to start getting uh, a bit more trust uh, from decision makers. So. Uh, this is not uh, operationalized yet, uh, because it's something we developed uh, uh, later on, but uh, it, the, it's uh, on the plan to, to be put directly on the younger map, so you will be also be able to, uh, to look at this kind of, of analysis, and this we think will help uh, yeah, in adopting a bit more this. Um, okay, so um, let's uh, take maybe not five because it's a bit late, but let's still take maybe just a couple of minutes break. Um, uh, yeah, drink a glass yeah. of water. 
Mm. Sorry, Michele, were you saying something? Yeah, I'm just saying, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let's let's take a couple of minutes break. Yeah, exactly. And I'll start back at 15, uh, like 3.15. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I guess yeah, I'll, um, I'll need to go a bit quicker to this through this second part and just give you a little uh, overview. Um, yeah, so the as I was mentioning at the beginning, the second question that uh, that we posed uh, was uh, about forecasting. So looking at how uh, food security indicators. Uh, 
um, how the food security situation is likely to evolve in the future. Um, and we could we can do this. So the, the basic idea of the first model is to have something for places where you don't collect often data, whereas in this case, it's rather the opposite. So there are all these places where we do collect data uh, in near real time and places like Yemen, where we have been doing this for like three years almost now. Um, and so the idea is there, okay, can we exploit this, uh, this uh, a large amount of data or at least extensive uh, time span of data uh, to, uh, to make predictions on how these time series are likely to evolve. And this is actually, um, this is um, a project that uh, was done uh, in collaboration between the World Food Program and the ISI Foundation, thanks, thanks to a Lagrange uh, Project Fellowship. So actually, uh, Michele um, uh, is, uh, is one of the, uh, of the, the main uh, author of this paper this uh, now preprint so here uh, this is the link so you will find more information uh, here um, and um, so what we use here is um, time series uh, for different spans of times uh, for six different countries to Syria and Yemen in, in, um, uh, in the Middle East and then uh, for more countries in West Africa these are basically the places where WFP has been collecting daily data for the longest uh, amount of time. Um, but so uh, the, the funny thing is that when you, when you think about it, like Yemen, for example, it's uh, now almost three years of data, which for WFP is really a huge quantity of data. They've never seen something like that before. Um, however, when you start thinking about it in terms of um, uh, really of uh, yeah, in a more quantity way, modeling, etc. Of course, this is this is not as huge, unfortunately, as one might might really think. Because even if you have daily data for three years, that's basically less than a thousand data points. Uh, that, yeah, for each area where you are collecting the data. Um, but yeah, in Yemen, for example, we have uh, twenty different um, administrative areas and uh, data for uh, two and a half. Um, uh, years there, so it starts to be mm, an amount of data that we can do something with, um, and uh, uh, partially this is the case also for for the other countries. But we'll see that uh, uh, that's not always uh, enough. Let's say. Um, so the first thing that we did looking at this uh, time. So here every every graph is for a different countries and every uh, every line represents the, the the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption so now we'll focus only on the on one indicator uh, basically uh, for each of the areas uh, of the um, yeah, covered areas in the country and also just by looking at this time series uh, we we can see that they are pretty noisy and uh, it's it's tough to even just by looking at them, like you might guess that it's not going to be an easy task to try to predict uh, their evolution. So the first thing that we did, uh, inspired by this paper uh, by Scarpino, uh, Sam Scarpino and Giovanni Petri, uh, on the predictability of infection disease outbreaks that um, came out a couple of years ago on Nature Communication. Uh, I don't know if maybe Sam will tell you a bit more about it this afternoon. Uh, but yeah, the idea is basically to try and test the intrinsic predictability of a time series uh, by means of this uh, permutation entropy approach. So the idea of measuring uh, uh, basically if, like the, if it is easy to find patterns uh, in the, if the, you, you encounter patterns in the, in the time series that you are analyzing. Uh, um, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, there's really not time to go in, into it. But if you want to know more about this metric, I, you can either find it, of course, in our paper, but even more details on um, Sam's and Giovanni's paper. Um, and uh, uh, so the idea, we, we looked at how this measure performs on our uh, time series, and what we find is really very low values. So uh, the predictability is given like by 
yeah, this matter is just one minus this entropy. And what we see is that for our time series, really values are around like all below 0 0.5, uh, way below, like more around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So these, uh, like in the context, for example, of infectious diseases, these values are uh, relatively higher. And these values are more similar to the ones that you could find, for example, in a financial time series. So something that is volatile and hard to predict. Uh, so this is the first thing that we found, uh, first limitation. And so we said, okay, so um, let's see if secondary information can help us uh, to do this forecast. And so we included the same like or similar values, value, uh, variables that we were, uh, that I also mentioned for the previous work. So uh, in this case, um, for this first work, what we're looking at is only the evolution of one of the two indicators. So the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption. So the first thing uh, that makes sense to include is also information on the past evolution also of the other uh, indicators, since of course uh, the two are um, highly related. Um, and then we uh, added information on the, the, the three main drivers that we, uh, that we mentioned. So number of the evolution on the conflict related fatalities, rainfall and DVI, uh, cereal prices. And then also we included a, a variable that uh, basically uh, tells you when in time uh, you uh, like basically uh, Ramadan is happening. And this is because all the countries analyzed in the studies are all countries where uh, Ramadan is uh, observed quite uh, extensively. Uh, and in what happens, what we have seen that happens uh, during Ramadan uh, is that actually, although people are fasting during the day, but then they are actually eating more and more nutritious various food during the night. So actually the the number of people with insufficient food consumption decreases uh, during ramadan and it, this this increase decrease light in that period can be easily explained if you if you take into this into account this uh, this simple variable uh, again we we went with an extra boost approach uh, i mean there we discussed in the paper uh, different uh, possibilities. Um, again, this is not the best model, uh, but this is a feasible approach given the number of data points that we have. Um, given that Exigus actually does not really support a multi-output design, we have a model for each prediction horizon. Uh, so for example, if you wanna predict one day into the future, three days, 30 days into the future. Um, so that's our output variable. So we have one model for each uh, uh, for each of these, and then we use the past history of the time series itself, as well as of uh, all these other uh, indicators that I mentioned. And here um, we also resort to uh, cross validation, but in this case, being uh, a time series uh, approach, so we have a time ordered k fold uh, uh, cross validation and. Uh, and here when we do validation, we don't only um, optimize hyperparameters, but also uh, features. Uh, and uh, instead of doing like a simple grid search, since we have many more um, parameters to, to combine together, we, uh, we use this um, Bayesian-based uh, 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 library called IPROPT. So a bit of a different way to, to do this uh, optimization by exploring. Uh, the space uh, of parameters in a bit of a smarter way. Um, so here's what we find for uh, for Yemen. So as I was saying, Yemen is really the sorry the the country where we have the uh, the highest uh, number of data points. Um, and here uh, here our naive approach is basically to look at the last measured value again. So here, for example, in this uh, in the panel D, you see like if your time series uh, arrives here, and then you try to predict from this point onwards. The blue line would be your naive model, where you just take the, the last available valuable um, value, and then your uh, orange line would be the uh, the result of your uh, forecast. Um, and so, basically, what we look here is 
basically how far away is our model from this uh, naive approach. And we see that a naive approach can already uh, explain up to 59% uh, of the variation. So an R square of uh, uh, 59, I'm, I'm talking about this value here. This is for a forecasting horizon of 30 days into the future. So here, what we see is that of course, for days, uh, uh, we start at very high, uh, our um, like um, our square values because if you want to predict the day after and you that that's very easy basically it's going to be something very very close to the day before but then as we move forwards in time up to 30 days we see that the naive model performs worse and worse our model also performs uh, less well but it's um, it has like a, a more um, a better uh, a better prediction. So it, um, it reaches uh, like around 71. Uh, the R square is here is 71 compared to 59 for the, for the naive. And here is the opposite uh, because of the, this is the, the, the mean uh, square error. So you want, of course, to have your model to have lower error than uh, the naive approach. Um, and here, basically, we see how uh, the data the actual versus uh, predicted data is distributed uh, um, across the, uh, the identity line. As, as you can see here, the colors represent a different forecasting horizon. So you, you see that, yeah, the blue points are closer to the identity line because they're easier to predict. And then, uh, yeah, like as the, you go towards green and yellow, you, you go farther away, but still the points are pretty much aligned. Uh, yeah, you, you can very well fit them basically um, across uh, like on the diagonal. Uh, we also looked at the feature importance uh, and basically what we see is that indeed uh, the indicators like the here FCG would be yeah, the prevalence of people with insufficient consumption and our society uh, is the prevalence of people using crisis or above uh, for big scoping just for uh, to make it shorter. Um, and as you can see, yes, like at the very beginning, you have that these are like the, 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 the features of your model that play the, the biggest role. But then as you move forward, you have other things that come up, like the price of cirrus and tuber, the rainfall anomaly, NDVI anomaly. Uh, and so really up to 30 days into the future, you have that your main variables are those uh, like, the, the, this external secondary information really plays a relevant uh, role, um, a, a more important role in the prediction than uh, past values of the um, of your indicators. And uh, finally, what we this is really say the last message. So we I showed you the results for Yemen, and this is where the model works best. It works. Mm, okay, also for Syria, uh, although not as well. And then we really saw that for the other countries, it was really not working well. A naive approach uh, could give better results. And so here, what we show is really the uh, importance of the, the amount of data. And this is something that, uh, of course, you uh, you uh, you might expect. Uh, but this is a very important message also for uh, yeah for WFP. Uh, because it shows that basically the more data you have, uh, the better uh, a forecasting model can perform. Um, and really, this is um, this is an important message because uh, there is still we're saying there's not enough trust yet on the predictive modeling, but there's also. Uh, this organization are also starting to understand now the value of really uh, collecting data on a regular basis. This has not been the approach for many, many years. And so it's really important uh, to show them that when you, uh, when you collect uh, data on a regular basis, you are not only able to uh, to see how the situation is evolving, to look at the past and the present, but then if you have enough data, if you do this data collection uh, regularly, you um, you can uh, really also um, inform models that will allow you to get a sense or uh, a first, uh, like a, an estimated idea of how the situation is likely to, uh, to evolve in the near future. So you have really um, a double advantage uh, of doing so. 
So yeah, I'll stop here because I know it's already 3.30 uh, and then I'll let, uh, yeah, Michele, <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Elisa. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I think, I mean, there's the, I mean, it was a great, great presentation uh, with uh, also many questions during the, during the talk. So I think, uh, uh, it raised uh, uh, quite some interest. So um, I don't know, I, I think we can take a couple of minutes if there are more questions. Actually, I have one, one question for you in the sense that uh, um, I'm thinking of, uh, so since, since the students uh, uh, of the school, uh, uh, we, we are trying to, um, uh, so to, to, to organize uh, group project works uh, where uh, students in team will address some uh, some uh, uh, small uh, uh, research project here. Uh, I'm thinking whether um, it, it would be, uh, so if, if there are uh, data sources they could use, for instance, to study or to try to investigate the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, on, uh, um, on food insecurity uh, with some publicly available data source. Uh, because I mean, this might be of interest for for some of them. I know some of the so the data sources we have been using for, uh, um, yeah, of course, to predict food insecurity in our work. Now I'm thinking maybe of the conflict data. We could use also that data uh, combined with the with the COVID-19 uh, incidents in some countries to see uh, maybe to study a bit of a feedback loop between conflict and, and epidemic. Uh, I'm just thinking of, uh, well, if it comes to my to your mind, uh, some some way um, that, uh, yeah, that the students could address this question, of course, uh, even on a very preliminary basis and with some coarse grained uh, data, of course, uh, that would be uh, very helpful and, uh, and interesting, I think, for, for some of them. Indeed, maybe as someone was also, um, suggesting in the chat about trying and look into um, data like Twitter or um, yeah. maybe it could be done like in some local specific context like, uh, for example, Latin America and Asia, which uh, have been high, uh, yeah, heavily hit by COVID and uh, at the same time where there's high penetration of this kind of technology. There we have less uh, data on food insecurity, but for example, Central America and Colombia, uh, so if you look on the younger map, you will see there's, uh, we do have, uh, for example, on the younger map, you will see the last uh, three months uh, uh, of the, for the two indicators, so you can use that as reference. Um, uh, in Asia, we really have very few places where we do the, the data collection, so maybe it's harder if you want to do the, yeah, like if you want to see um, a specific, uh, yeah, like really look at correlations or, or this kind of things, but um, Mm, yeah, or otherwise you can also uh, take a look at the um, database uh, platform where we, we make publicly available, available food prices, economic indicators, also all the, the weather information is there. So let me maybe share the link. Yeah, uh, right. well, I think this would be very helpful uh, because yeah, uh, yeah, you, you, have, you have data on, on like food prices, for instance. So Exactly. So uh, here, here's the link and yeah, all of this data is uh, uh, publicly available, can be downloaded if you select a yeah, specific country, you can download everything through CSV files, etc. So uh, yeah, yeah my that's, that's great. I think this could be this could be a uh, so uh, starting point for uh, for one of the research projects, uh, uh, like trying to combine uh, this type of data with uh, public available data on, on the pandemic uh, and see, I mean, whether there is some uh, relations uh, uh, between uh, the food uh, insecurity as measured by prices, etc., with uh, with the pandemic itself. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, yeah, there's the API, like the, all this uh, data that we also used in our work, uh, yeah, like the idea is to make them all public and downloadable. Unfortunately, the API is not uh, ready yet. Uh, so yeah, yeah, for the purposes of this week, uh, uh, yeah, I can, yeah, there's, um, there's no way of really downloading it directly, but maybe, yeah, you can either use the younger map uh, and scrape it. <laughs> no, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> or yeah, like, um, or at least to, to get a re some reference uh, numbers. And on the younger map, every time you click on a country, you will know if it's predicted or actual data. So of course, for the purposes of this kind of project, I would rather focus on the actual data, right? Because we don't want to compare with something that is already a product of a prediction. So, um, I've also shared the link to the Arclid data. Uh, the the Arclid data, so for, for uh, everyone uh, who is, uh, um, so might, might have missed this information, this is data about uh, political conflict uh, and violence uh, around the world. So this is a data, data set that uh, uh, tracks uh, the number of fatalities, uh, number of uh, um, conflict events uh, uh, due to, to political uh, uh, conflict in uh, in all the countries of the world, and, and this is a very very interesting data set for to to, to study um, uh, so yeah, in the political sciences uh, on a in, with with data. Uh, so okay, I think uh, uh, we can only say thanks, uh, Elisa. Thank you very much for for this uh, presentation uh, and for your time. So uh, at this point, we will uh, uh, take. Uh, um, uh, 20 minutes uh, break, and uh, uh, we will reconvene at uh, uh, so in 20 minutes. So it's going to be 4 p.m. here in uh, in Turin, in Italy. And uh, uh, so with the, with the hands-on part, uh, I will uh, um, give a, a brief uh, introduction to to Python and geospatial data. So thanks, Elisa. Have a, a good oh, afternoon, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Okay, so I stopped the recording here. Okay. So uh, the idea, uh, of course, I mean, for, for this summer school, uh, uh, there's many of you uh, with a very different backgrounds uh, and uh, uh, with a very diverse uh, uh, level uh, uh, of experience with coding. Uh, we have selected uh, uh, your, um, your profiles uh, based on your previous experience, uh, but also keeping a mixture of uh, more senior uh, and, uh, and younger uh, students. So the idea, of course, uh, here is to uh, uh, provide everyone with some uh, uh, basic uh, level uh, of, of knowledge uh, about, uh, about uh, um, applications and examples of, of coding to computational social sciences tasks. And uh, uh, today, I will start from some uh, very basics. Uh, and, uh, and I know that for uh, many of you, probably uh, this is already uh, well known. Um, everything is well known and probably more, uh, many of you already have a, a, a good experience uh, being uh, graduate students or, or even postdoc uh, in, uh, in, in the usage uh, of, uh, of uh, scripting languages like Python or R. Uh, but I know also that for some of you, this may, uh, might be actually uh, new and, uh, and, and, and useful for, for your research. So I will, I will try to somehow condense. Uh, it's gonna be a, a, an exercise also for me uh, from some starting from uh, uh, very basic uh, concept uh, uh, to uh, some applications that might be also uh, new for for, uh, uh, for 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 some of you who have not were not familiar with uh, geospatial analysis. Uh, and uh, first of all, so the the, the examples uh, I will show are all based uh, on Python. Um, so we 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 are, we will use Python as a. Uh, language for for the the examples for the hands-on because it's the language we use uh, in uh, in our uh, uh, in our daily research. Uh, um, of course, I mean this uh, does not limit uh, you on the language you, uh, on the coding language that you will use for your own project uh, uh, for the project work. Uh, and, and of course, I know that some of you are more familiar with R, and and of course uh, uh, you can uh, use R. Uh, to, to, to do your project work. Um, and, 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 and we know also that it's, uh, I mean, most of the things that can be done in one language, of course, can be done in the other, uh, can be, everything can be translated. Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, present uh, uh, a few, a couple of notebooks, uh, of, of notebooks with some examples in, uh, in Python. And uh, the idea uh, is that uh, uh, I'm gonna share the code, so I already, uh, uploaded the code I'm, I'm going to show you on on a GitHub uh, repository, 
And here I'm, I'm uh, gonna show you the, sorry, I'm gonna show the, my desktop. So now you should be able to see and let me uh, see, okay. So uh, in, the, in, in the slides of the introductory presentation, I, I, I have uh, linked this uh, GitHub repository, which is uh, public. So um, for, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, GitHub uh, uh, and, and Git, uh, so Git is a, is a versioning uh, software uh, system and uh, uh, GitHub uh, is, uh, um, Sorry, I'm interrupting you because I see things in the in the chat. Which, uh, okay, yeah, I'm sharing the link in the chat for sure. So, um, so GitHub is is a is a is a web platform that allows to uh, share code and, uh, and code versioning on, uh, on um, and so to, to build a large uh, software project and, and share them uh, uh, publicly or privately. In, in our case, uh, this is a, a public repository uh, where uh, I will upload uh, um, the code also of the, of the, next, uh, of the next lectures. Um, you can access uh, uh, the code from here uh, uh, well, just by downloading, if you if you wish, so you can just download here uh, as a, as a zip file. But actually, the the usefulness of, of GitHub is actually that you can clone the repository, uh, and and um, a good way to doing it is using a GitHub Desktop, for instance, uh, where uh, it's the, the the most commonly used application to um, uh, clone the repository, which means making a, a, a full copy on your own uh, computer, on your own laptop, and then keep it updated by just pulling the repository every, uh, every time we uh, will upload a new, um, new uh, notebooks and new, new parts of code. And uh, uh, in this way, you will have a, a completely a fully updated version of, uh, of, the, of the repository every time we, we will upload uh, the, the notebooks. Um, so uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this repository, which is yeah, basically a folder, um, uh, you, you can see, I mean, basically there are two files. There are these uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, IPYNB, uh, where uh, there are uh, basically two files that contain uh, um, uh, Python code that can be executed and uh, I will show you how. And then there is a data folder, uh, data folder where uh, I will show you uh, the, uh, the, the data set that are uh, geospatial data and in particular uh, uh, the, there are shape files inside this, uh, in the, inside this folder. Uh, so uh, we will use Python, as I said, and uh, um, I, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with Python already. Uh, my suggestion for those who haven't uh, uh, used it, who have never used it or, or uh, have, are less familiar with it uh, or do not have uh, um, uh, a, a full, uh, let's say, uh, a, a version, a recent version of Python installed in their laptop is to use uh, the uh, Anaconda um, bundle. So basically uh, you can install uh, um, a, a full uh, uh, Python installation that basically contains uh, all the models and the libraries that you may need for most of the, of the research tasks uh, that, are, uh, that are considering in, in our summer school by installing uh, the uh, Anaconda Python uh, 3.7, which is uh, um, uh, downloadable from this, uh, this website and, uh, and for free, the individual, uh, individual version. And, and you can download it for uh, uh, all, it's available for uh, all type of pl platforms you are using. So whether it's, uh, it's a Mac, uh, uh, or Windows uh, or, or Linux, and uh, and then you can uh, basically installing this one big uh, um, installer, uh, uh, you have access to all the Python libraries that uh, that are relevant for for our course. In particular, you will have access uh, to uh, the um, 
to the Jupyter uh, notebook in, in Jupyter uh, lab, uh, which are the um, the um, which are the um, environments that uh, we are gonna where we are gonna um, uh, actually display. I'm gonna display the code and and, and running it and, and showing it. So here, um, basically, I'm. Uh, on my um, uh, on my terminal on my shell uh, uh, on my on my Mac. I hope uh, everyone should be able to to see the the whole thing. And uh, um, basically, uh, I'm also uh, already in the in the folder where where the code is. So the the same uh, uh, social Quant summer school where the two files are mentioned are are present. And uh, uh, I'm using this uh, this command to run. Uh, the Jupyter, which is basically a web uh, interface to uh, run uh, the code, the, the, the Python code uh, from uh, from the browser, basically into um, into a, a, a notebook format. So here uh, I, I can I can run it. You can see that basically it opens uh, um, a tab here where I'm basically. Uh, having access to um, the two uh, notebooks, the two files. Here on the left, uh, I see uh, the file, uh, the, 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 the file tree. So basically uh, the two files uh, and, uh, and the data folder. And, uh, and the two files are also open in this uh, um, uh, window uh, next, on, uh, next to it on the right. Where basically are these are notebook uh, 01 and notebook 02 and and basically uh, here a notebook is uh, um, an object that contains uh, is formed by cells and cell can contain uh, uh, either uh, um, markdown so comments and text and uh, uh, code itself so basically um, uh, here you can see a cell that is made by uh, by text and uh, and here is a cell that is uh, that contains code and uh, python code and uh, um, the, the the jupyter lab allows me to run uh, code inside the cells and uh, uh, immediately see uh, the output uh, of the code uh, within uh, within the notebook uh, the the idea uh, of using Python, well, basically uh, the the main choice is that it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's easy. Let's say Python, it's easy. It's a bit uh, uh, it's a bit of a joke. Here I can show, for instance, uh, the, there is a famous uh, a now old but famous uh, uh, it's K, um, it's KCD um, uh, comic. Uh, that basically uh, tries to 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 explain with a joke uh, why uh, I mean Python gets uh, it has become so uh, familiar and so relevant uh, in scientific computing because it basically allows uh, uh, everyone to um, uh, actually Im import a large variety of libraries and modules uh, and uh, and and basically in a very in a very easy to understand. Uh, uh, way um, uh, allows to uh, access uh, uh, all type of functionalities uh, that are, that can be useful in any in any scientific uh, uh, computing environment, uh, and um, and so uh, as you can see uh, the the notebook allows to um, import and, and basically to use uh, um, uh, and write code inside cells and immediately display the output. Here, what I've done was basically to import uh, um, a module from, from, from this library and just uh, uh, show an image from the, uh, taken from the web. And so basically here I'm taking a, an image from, uh, from, uh, from an URL and just display it uh, on, uh, on, on the notebook. Uh, the, the notebook uh, is very convenient uh, as a form of, uh, of writing code because you can mix uh, the, the, the coding part uh, uh, and and comments and text so explain and comment what's what's your what your code is doing in a very uh, uh, inter easy to interpret way so that uh, you can format the text uh, of, of your uh, uh, that, that is uh, um, uh, coming along with your code uh, so that it's easy to, to, to read for uh, for everyone and not only for for yourself and uh, at the same time, 
you can also, uh, of course, integrate uh, images and display uh, plots and charts uh, uh, that are um, uh, produced by, by your code. Um, uh, of course, I mean, here um, I have a very, uh, the time is very, is very short. It's not supposed to be an in-depth course uh, in Python. There are uh, an enormous amount of resources uh, available uh, on the web. And uh, here I'm, I'm basically uh, pointing to um, two uh, resources that may be useful for uh, specifically for, for those of you who, who want to uh, get a good, uh, a good intro. Uh, one is the Scientific Python Lectures by Jobert Johansson, uh, where they basically, which is the, the main basis of, of, of the notebook I'm showing you right now. Um, and, uh, and also there is another one that is a, an intro tutorial by Eric Mattes, uh, also uh, available on, uh, both available on the web. Uh, lots of examples, uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, notebooks commented, uh, very well done. Uh, and in the following, this notebook will, will mainly follow the lectures by, by Robert Johansson. Uh, here again, I'm saying I'm, I will, uh, um, I will go very briefly uh, through the uh, ideas of what you can do uh, in, um, uh, with the notebook and in using Python. And uh, I, I, I know that, yeah, most of you are already familiar with this, uh, but I just don't want to leave uh, anyone uh, uh, far behind uh, just because of, of, of just trying to put uh, a, a starting point of view, uh, point, point to common to, to everyone. And of course, uh, uh, feel free to, to ask more questions or maybe uh, reach out uh, to me also uh, after the end of the, of the lecture if you have doubts and, uh, and you uh, uh, need more, uh, uh, more help in, uh, in this. Um, so as I said here, uh, I think one, one easy way to install Python in the Jupyter Notebook is using the Anaconda distribution that, uh, that I've shown you. Uh, for those who have uh, never worked with this, it, it's a kind of uh, a very streamlined way. Um, and then the, the Jupyter project uh, and how to install it. Okay, with Anaconda, you already get the Jupyter project, but um, you can also have more information uh, in the uh, page of, of the Jupyter project, the web page of the Jupyter project itself with more uh, documentation uh, about it. Uh, and uh, um, uh, again, in the in the scientific python course uh, uh, by uh, Johan, uh, by Johansson there is a good explanation of uh, um, uh, how to install and then uh, run uh, um, python code and well there's quite a, a big uh, um, number of uh, uh, examples and uh, and explanation a different way to 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 use the code so i i really invite you for those uh, who are less familiar with it, to, to go through the notebooks, uh, um, which are very, very well done. Um, so as I said, uh, basically in notebook is a series, uh, uh, is made by a series of cells and you can, we can run code using the, the shift enter command uh, on, on a cell or run the, this play uh, button at the top. Uh, here, for instance, uh, I will immediately show you that uh, Inside each cell, we can run Python code, but actually the, the notebook uh, also uh, understands uh, um, uh, basic uh, um, uh, basic scripts also in, in Bash, for instance, and uh, um, and so in, in Unix command uh, like this uh, ls that shows the content of uh, of the folder. Uh, the code is run in a separate process that is that's called the kernel, and uh, and the kernel uh, is uh, can be interrupted or restarted. If it's uh, uh, restarted, uh, interrupted or restarted, we will uh, lose uh, the content of the variables so uh, that are that are uh, um, that are kept uh, in in memory. So uh, we need to be we careful with this. Uh, so the interruption of the kernel can be done through this button. Uh, restarting the kernel can be done uh, with this uh, other button. Um, then uh, the most of functionalities in Python are provided by modules. And there is a, uh, the Python standard library that is a large collection of modules that provides uh, 
all type of implementations uh, of uh, common uh, uh, facilities uh, like access uh, to the operating system, uh, the import output of uh, files, uh, string management, uh, uh, and uh, basic uh, mathematical functions, for instance. For instance, the module math allows to import uh, uh, basic uh, uh, mathematical functions, like here, for instance, the cosine, the value of pi, for instance. Um, and here you can see already a bit of the uh, of the syntax of Python, uh, where we can assign variables uh, with this uh, with, with the simple uh, x equal to something and print it with uh, with uh, with the command uh, print. Uh, uh, we can uh, another thing that Python uh, can be done in Python is to import this only some symbols uh, of. Uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a module uh, into the namespace. So for instance, here from math, we import only the function uh, cosine and the value and the symbol pi. And uh, uh, we then we will not need uh, to specify that these uh, two functions belong to the, uh, to the, to the module, uh, to the module math. Or we can assign a module to a different symbol, for instance, using uh, uh, MTH instead of math and doing the, the same thing. Uh, there is a lot of uh, help functions. I mean, the, the notebook also and Python is, uh, uh, is very user friendly because you can use uh, the help function to get uh, all the information about a specific function or here a specific module. Uh, and all the functions that it contains and here, for instance, for the math module, there is there are many functions, of course, uh, with the uh, a good description of uh, uh, every function, what, what it does. Um, then uh, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can also get help by uh, using the tab completion. So basically here, for instance, we import the module name NumPy and then by uh, just uh, uh, basically uh, uh, pressing the tab, the tab key, uh, uh, the, the, the notebook uh, uh, will, uh, will uh, suggest uh, me which are the possible functions that belong to NumPy random. And so here are all the possible choices that I can make uh, uh, after uh, setting uh, the numpy.random dot uh, something else, and uh, and then I can choose if I don't remember a specific uh, um, a specific function or how it's called. Um, numpy is a, is a module actually that provides uh, structures and functions for scientific computing, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's it's definitely very useful to operate uh, with arrays or. Uh, uh, um, or a matrix or other other objects of, of this of this type. Uh, we can use the the the, the uh, question mark symbol also to get more information about a specific model, and uh, that is always nicely formatted. And you can see all the content of of a model here, for instance. Uh, another very good thing of, of of Python in general and of the notebook is the the fact that exceptions are formatted nicely. So when you uh, try to do, for instance, a division by zero, you get uh, a, a clear error um, a box that shows you where the error is and uh, what is the line where you are making a mistake. The code is uh, cannot, cannot, be, cannot be run. Uh, <clears throat> the assignment operator is the equal symbol, uh, as I said, and, uh, and Python is dynamically typed language. So the point, a very important thing is that we do not need to specify the type of variable when we create one. And uh, for instance, we can have uh, three variables and say that uh, uh, variable A is an integer, variable B uh, is a float, uh, variable C uh, is a is a string, and uh, uh, the, the 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 kernel doesn't need to know in advance uh, uh, that these variables are, are of this type, and we can always reassign variables of different types afterwards uh, without uh, um, making this explicit uh, uh, before beforehand. Uh, there is also this uh, load um, uh, load magic. So here is basically. This, uh, this syntax is the percentage plus load. You can import the code from local files or from the URL. If you have some, uh, for instance, load my script, uh, dot py. if you have uh, a script written on a file that is called myscript.py, uh, uh, then you can load it into the, the in import in, into the, uh, the notebook by, by using just this, uh, uh, this function. 
um, uh, strings uh, are variables that are used to uh, store in text. And uh, like, for instance, the, the, the C was a string. My string is made of characters. We can access uh, single characters uh, uh, by uh, position. So for instance, uh, it's treating basically a string as an array. So basically the, the letter, uh, the first letter of the string can be accessed by uh, just using this uh, C zero. So, uh, and then we can, uh, we can also slice it. So this is another Python functionality with this syntax, we slice the strings and we, and we uh, select only the first the five characters, which are of course uh, the first two, then there is an empty space and then there are the last two. We can also, uh, so the indexing is also uh, allowed to be reversed. So we can access uh, the, the, the second last element of the string by the, using this, uh, uh, this index minus two. And actually Python has a really rich set of functions for text processing. So uh, uh, for in general to manipulate the text, uh, Python is, is a very uh, no, a large number of libraries that are quite advanced uh, to, 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 yeah, to process text, to manipulate text. Uh, and here, okay, I will not go much into details, but we will see uh, in the next uh, um, in the next lectures, uh, some uh, some examples in the in the next days. Um, so then uh, we have lists, of course, uh, that are similar to strings, but uh, elements can be of any type, and not only characters. And here, for instance, we have a, a list uh, of uh, of integers. And again, we can access uh, elements uh, by indexing in the in the also in the reversed order. So minus one is the last element of a, of, a, of a list. Uh, the len allows to to know which is what is the length of a of a of a list. Uh, we can create a, populate a list by um, by ranges. So with the with the function range, we can create a list l and then print the content of the list here. For instance, uh, we have a list that starts at ten, stops at thirty with uh, with step two, and here you can see also how a for loop is uh, is written in uh, in Python. Uh, tuples is an, they are another uh, type of variables in Python uh, where are, that are like lists, but they cannot modify it once they are created. So they are immutable. And uh, uh, so they are with this uh, uh, parentheses and basically uh, they can be useful yeah, to create objects that cannot be uh, modified in, in your code. And uh, you can always access, uh, and here you can see if I try to reassign the value, uh, to reassign the first uh, element of a tuple, uh, uh, I will get an error. Uh, and then I can always, uh, of course, uh, um, access elements uh, uh, with, the, with the standard indexing. Uh, then uh, we have dictionaries in Python that are also like lists, but uh, uh, each element is a key value pair. So the, the syntax for dictionary is the, of this uh, graph parentheses, uh, and basically the uh, key uh, values and the uh, value uh, and the value pairs are separated by um, a, a, a column. And uh, and here, for instance, uh, I see a I create a dictionary that assigns to the to the string parameter one, parameter two, parameter three, three different values, and uh, uh, the um, Keys in a dictionary are always, uh, are always uh, uh, unique, uh, while values uh, can be, uh, of course, uh, uh, not, uh, not unique. Uh, then I can, we can always access the keys uh, of, of a dictionary uh, using the, um, the, the, the function keys, and then also uh, reassign different values uh, to uh, different keys or create new keys in a dictionary. Uh, for instance, here I'm assigning parameter four. Uh, the notebook uh, uh, supports the, uh, the text, uh, the adding of text uh, using markdown cells. So this is a markdown cell here. The type of cell can be seen uh, here in, the, in, this, uh, in this part of the, of the notebook, where basically I have a markdown code. Uh, in markdown, okay, markdown uh, is a, uh, is a markup language that basically is a superset of HTML, and uh, and so we can also include the HTML inside the uh, inside the cells if you if you wish, and uh, it will be uh, interpreted by by the notebook. Uh, then you can with Markdown you can create lists, 
uh, yeah, I'm just showing an example. Uh, you create, uh, I mean, you, you can format the text uh, in a, uh, with the, in a very different styles, uh, uh, in bold, uh, italic. Uh, you can uh, put hyperlinks, as you see. Uh, you can uh, uh, create the headings of different uh, uh, of, the, of, of different levels, so create the subheadings for for your uh, for your notebook. You can embed code. Uh, you can uh, import images. Uh, create tables here, as, as I'm showing you. Uh, this is like a table in HTML, and uh, it will be displayed. Uh, you can uh, import uh, images. Uh, or even uh, YouTube videos, uh, um, iframe. I mean, this is mm, mm, yeah, web pages. Uh, you can also use uh, LaTeX. So for those who are familiar with, with LaTeX, uh, um, uh, uh, so it's uh, um, it's a language for uh, for writing for for uh, typographic writing and uh, very useful to write uh, equations and uh, and also this can be displayed in the uh, in the notebook. Uh, then there are a couple of libraries uh, that uh, uh, will be useful, uh, definitely useful. And one library, uh, one one library that uh, uh, will be extremely useful for uh, your uh, um, your projects. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, it's 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 uh, like the standard uh, for anyone who uses uh, uh, Python for data science and for uh, uh, scientific uh, computing is Pandas. Um, Pandas uh, uh, is, uh, is an open source uh, library that basically provides uh, high performance uh, data structures uh, for, for Python. Um, uh, and basically, it provides uh, um, uh, a number of uh, uh, functionalities uh, to manipulate uh, tabular data. Uh, even uh, of, of large size. So basically, when uh, uh, you have uh, uh, to deal with tabular data, which is like most of the time, uh, typically, I mean, it's, a, it's a most common task you have to, uh, you, uh, you will probably uh, use pandas uh, in, in Python, as you will be able to select and slice uh, your tabular data, make operations uh, uh, on, on, on it. Uh, the pandas, again, uh, is, uh, uh, comes with the Anaconda distribution. So if you install uh, uh, Anaconda, you will have access to, to, um, to, to pandas. Uh, and uh, again, the, this is a very, very, uh, commonly used uh, library. I mean, it's very popular. It's become a standard in, uh, uh, for many applications. There are several uh, excellent uh, tutorials uh, that, that you can uh, uh, follow to, to know more about, uh, about how to use Pandas. Uh, one uh, is the official one. I mean, actually, the, the, if, you, if, you, if you go to the documentation of the library, uh, there is a very good uh, uh, Pandas uh, cookbook uh, that actually uh, gets you into the, the library uh, with uh, with several uh, uh, lessons uh, uh, with uh, lots of uh, details and examples and I, I really recommend it uh, I think it, it's very well done uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm showing you some uh, some basic uh, basic applications of uh, uh, of pandas just showing you uh, how how this uh, how it works uh, so typically uh, we import uh, pandas uh, uh, the common way to import pandas into the namespace is by using pd as a as a uh, as a, a variable name for for pandas um, and then of course we want to import data uh, into pandas and uh, um, Okay, of course, there are several ways of doing that. One easy way is to read the data from uh, uh, an external file, it's like a CSV file, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the most classic way. So, uh, uh, and, and we will see, I mean, just to, to import a, a, a comma separated value file into a, a, a data frame, a, a, a tabular uh, format. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, an example that is uh, slightly different, it basically, uh, is based on, uh, on a module that is called the Pandas uh, Data Reader uh, that actually allows to automatically access data remotely. 
from a number of, of resources. Actually, this might be useful also for, for, the, for the project. So with Pandas Data Reader, uh, you uh, are able to basically download automatically uh, data from uh, a number of different official sources, typically uh, economic uh, sources and the financial uh, sources. For instance, uh, <clears throat> Yahoo Finance that uh, <clears throat> uh, gives access to uh, the uh, stock market uh, uh, in different uh, different countries, uh, different stock markets, but also you will be able to access uh, data from the World Bank, uh, Eurostat, uh, um, OECD. So these are uh, more uh, macroeconomic uh, data sets that, that you will be able to access directly using uh, uh, using this uh, uh, Pandas uh, uh, data reader. Uh, so here I imported the Pandas uh, data reader uh, as PDR uh, to, for short. Um, and then one, one thing, for instance, that we can uh, uh, select, for instance, to, uh, to, to, to analyze um, the financial data. For instance, we can uh, get the data from, uh, uh, from the stock market uh, using the function that is get data Yahoo, that basically uh, uh, connects uh, to the uh, Yahoo Finance. Mm -hmm. So basically here you can see uh, the um, Yahoo Finance uh, data. Um, the, and basically we can choose to uh, select the data uh, from uh, a given date to uh, an end date. So we set the start date and then end date. So here you can see I'm, I'm setting a date uh, as a string. So if this is just a string. 2020-0101, and then I translate it into uh, a, a daytime object. So I need to do this because uh, the, uh, the function does not recognize the date itself uh, as a string, but I need to convert it into, into a daytime. And Pandas allows to do this. So with, with Pandas, we can, uh, uh, with the function to daytime, we can uh, uh, translate uh, a string that contains a date into a daytime object. And then I, I will feed this into the get data Yahoo to collect uh, the uh, basically the, the stock market values of uh, the Apple shares uh, between uh, the 1st of January 2020 and the 1st of April 2020. And uh, here, then uh, at the end, I show, uh, I, I, I inspect the data frame. So I, I get the data here and I save it into this data frame DF. And here I can see uh, how it looks like. So I have uh, 63 uh, days of, uh, of data. And this is uh, the typical object that Pandas deals with. So this is a data frame uh, where for each date, each row, uh, have different uh, columns, different values. So the the, the open value. So this is uh, the value of the of the uh, of the stock of the Apple stock on that date at the opening, at the closing, the highest uh, uh, value of, of that date, the lowest, the volume traded, and the just the closing. So here, this is a, a simple data frame where I have. Uh, uh, 63 rows and, and six columns. And, and this is the type of object that Pandas deals with uh, that you can uh, easily access and slice, and especially you can plot directly. So one, one, uh, um, one thing that we can do with a very simple uh, um, line of code is just to plot uh, uh, one column. Let's say we want to plot uh, the, the open column. Uh, so how this varied in time. And basically, um, uh, we can see here. Uh, I immediately see the, the the values of the of the open um, open open uh, uh, of the Apple stock over the days of the period. So clearly, I mean, in March 2020, the pandemic uh, struck, and then here we have this huge drop uh, in the in the market. Uh, uh, so has the the pandemic shock uh, uh, hits. Uh, then. Uh, we can also uh, uh, use uh, uh, functions like uh, uh, compute the maximum uh, uh, value, return the maximum value of a column, for instance, the column volume or the minimum value of the column low, and then create a new column. For instance, I can just create a new column that I call diff by computing the difference between the high and the low. And, and you can see here, it will appear like, uh, an, an, like a last column here on the, 
on the right with this uh, with the values uh, computed and uh, of course we can do may, much more in terms of uh, applying functions to different columns and, and, and manipulate those values uh, and create new columns with, uh, with, with, new, with new values. Uh, finally, to conclude this, uh, uh, this notebook, uh, um, I want to show, of course, one, one of the main uh, um, uh, capabilities, the main features that the notebook uh, um, gives access to is uh, using Matplotlib. Uh, and uh, Matplotlib is uh, uh, is a, is a library that uh, for, for uh, um, uh, generating scientific figures. So to create figures, to create plots and, and charts, um, uh, uh, a way to uh, display the plots inside the notebook is to use this command pylab inline that uh, uh, will import matplotlib and show the, the, the results uh, uh, in, uh, in the code. I've already seen this is integrated into pandas. So we can uh, always, uh, um, uh, make plots directly with pandas but you can also create plots uh, using the plt um, uh, name so that gives access to um, to matplotlib and for instance here i'm, I'm just plotting uh, two variables x and y x is an is a is an array of of, of points so uh, between zero and five with a space by um, uh, by basically 10, 10 points line space between zero and five and and the y variable is just the power of two of the x variable and then i just want to show them plot them on on a plot and here i, I can do it by just say setting a figure plt figure uh, plot the function plot of matplotlib x and y and uh, and, and red color and then setting labels for the axis and uh, and title for uh, uh, for this uh, uh, and the title for for this plot, um, and last, the very last uh, here, um, uh, one one uh, um, uh, visualization library that is based on Matplotlib and can be used for also to create a more sophisticated plots. is uh, it's called Seaborn. Uh, actually, uh, it can be uh, useful. Uh, probably you won't. You, you won't use it so much uh, um, in uh, if you are just a beginner with, with Python, but it's useful to make uh, more uh, complex plots, uh, more uh, sophisticated plots. So for instance, uh, uh, Seaborn allows to, uh, for instance, create uh, a kernel density estimation plot of a distribution uh, that with a simple with a simple function that is KDA plot. The um, the library also is very, very well documented in the um, in, in, its, uh, in the website, seaborn.pydata.org. And if you want to, to know more about, about this. Um, yeah, so this was basically everything I wanted to, um, to show very, of course, I mean, this was very, very fast and very, uh, very also uh, uh, on, on the surface of, of, of the Python language. So uh, clearly um, a very, very quick introduction uh, and just a, an idea to get a few pointers for those who want to learn more uh, on, on the language. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, um, I mean, for those who are already, already familiar, I mean, this is, was, was probably uh, well known. Um, after this, uh, okay, I think uh, uh, I will take uh, uh, another half an hour or so, maybe uh, we will go, um, let's say until, uh, um, uh, until 5.30 here uh, for the, um, the part on the geospatial data analysis. Uh, that is another notebook here uh, that, that I'm showing you. Maybe we just take uh, a two minutes break. Let's say, yeah, really two, two, three minutes break. And then I will show the, the other, the other notebook and, uh, and check uh, the chat and everything else uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, I'm not missing uh, uh, anyone. So stop sharing here. Okay. Let's see the, the second notebook, which is a, a, yeah, more a, a deep dive into 
the visualization of the um, geospatial data and some some examples uh, of how to visualize uh, uh, spatially um, resolved uh, data sets. So I'm sharing the screen here. I think. So I hope everyone can can see again the the notebook. And uh, um, basically, uh, in this notebook, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, give I will I will uh, go into. Uh, a bit more details uh, on a on a specific library uh, that it's uh, called uh, GeoPandas. Uh, it's uh, it's another Python library uh, that is uh, specifically um, uh, devoted to the uh, analysis uh, uh, of uh, geospatial data and uh, uh, of, of of data that has some uh, uh, spatial uh, structure. Now, uh, of course, I mean, GeoPandas, uh, uh, as the name says, is, is basically an extension of, of Pandas. So uh, as Pandas allows to um, manipulate uh, tabular data uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and to uh, apply functions uh, of different types to uh, data structure in, in tables, GeoPandas basically adds another layer to this, uh, to, to a tabular data by, by adding a layer of, uh, um, of, of spatial information, basically. So it combines all the functionalities of, of Pandas uh, uh, into uh, a geospatial uh, uh, structure. And so uh, it allows also to visualize uh, uh, the data on uh, creating maps and, uh, and, uh, and objects that have uh, a spatial structure. Uh, here I'm using, so the notebook I'm showing you uh, is largely based uh, on, on, on a notebook that was written uh, uh, by uh, Professor Osano Schifanella at the University of Turin. And here actually I'm uh, linking a repository uh, of, of, of a course. Uh, his uh, uh, course is lecturing uh, Rossano Schifanelli is lecturing at the University of Turin, uh, on specifically on uh, spatial data analysis. Uh, and in, in the repository, you will find uh, many more um, uh, notebooks uh, and examples, uh, and also uh, slides of, of the lectures uh, on, on the topic of, uh, of geospatial uh, analysis. And, uh, and here today, uh, of course, I mean, this will be uh, again, a kind of uh, introduction, but uh, I hope this could be useful also for, for, for several applications uh, uh, and research tasks that you may face, uh, since it's, it's very common in computational social sciences to have, uh, um, to deal with, uh, with data that have some uh, spatial uh, information, typically uh, coordinates uh, uh, of, of points, uh, for instance, uh, and we, we are, there are several examples in, that comes to my mind. Uh, of course, uh, uh, social media data may have uh, uh, geographic information associated with them, uh, but also in general, uh, all type of uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, features uh, uh, are uh, typically measured at some geographic resolution, right? And so it's very, very common uh, to uh, manipulate uh, and to visualize this type of information uh, uh, on, uh, on maps. So in this notebook, uh, um, uh, we start with, uh, with uh, um, the typical uh, uh, imports at the beginning of, of, of the notebook. Uh, what is relevant uh, here, uh, it's, uh, it's this uh, import. So we import the library uh, uh, GeoPandas uh, as JPD. Uh, then uh, we import uh, a, a couple of other libraries, for instance, uh, as you can, as you have seen before, as you just mentioned, the Seaborn, which is a library uh, that 
uh, it's uh, needed for uh, uh, make visualizations uh, uh, a bit more appealing, but actually uh, it's not fundamental for, for the type of analysis. Uh, it's, it's more an aesthetic uh, choice. Matplotlib is the, the library we need to, um, uh, of course, to make plots uh, and, and, and visualizations. And, and uh, uh, GeoPandas as well is integrated with Matplotlib, so uh, as Pandas is. And so all the plots and the visualizations uh, uh, can be done uh, uh, within the notebook uh, using Matplotlib and, uh, and GeoPandas. Uh, together. Um, so, um, first of all, of course, here, uh, the, the question is, what type of uh, spatial data we can import and we can load uh, uh, with Geo, uh, GeoPandas, uh, with GeoPandas. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the GeoPanda supports uh, the same functionality that Pandas does. So basically, the machinery uh, behind the GeoPandas is, is, is the same of Pandas. Uh, and, uh, and on top of that, uh, it has uh, the capability of uh, uh, import and load all type of vector files uh, that have some uh, uh, geospatial information uh, uh, associated with uh, with them, um, uh, one type, and here I will show basically one type of spatial da data uh, that we can uh, import, and that are uh, most common type of spatial data in the social sciences, are uh, are polygons, uh, uh, typically in the form of shape files. So a shape file here I'm showing better. Uh, it's it's uh, shape files are, are shared uh, uh, in this folder data. So here in the same uh, in the same repository you will see the data folder and uh, um, the shape file SHP. And here you can see uh, a large number of different files that have uh, uh, several extensions. But uh, for each file name you will see the extension SHP. So SHP uh, indeed stands for, for shape file. A shape file is a, um, is a, shape, uh, is a, is a file uh, format uh, that was uh, originally created uh, uh, by ESRI, uh, which is a, a company, uh, an important company of spatial analysis that has become uh, uh, basically uh, the standard format in the sector uh, of those working with uh, uh, spatial uh, data. And uh, a shape file actually is not only one single uh, file, the SHP, but actually is, a, is made by a collection of different files that together make uh, a so-called shape file. So here, for instance, the first one I'm, I'm showing you is the, this uh, uh, USA shape, which is made by, by six different files. And each, each, each file contains specific information that are associated to this object. And that basically uh, allows the um, uh, plotting, the charting of, this, of the polygons that are contained in this, uh, in this file. Um, the, 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 the thing is that uh, uh, with the GeoPandas, uh, you can uh, read the shape file just by uh, basically providing the path to the SHP uh, file. Uh, so here, we will, uh, uh, we know that the, the data, sorry, this is the file is, is this one, data, sorry, I'm loading here. And then we can read the, the file. So this is a file that contains uh, a shape of the United States, basically the geographic information, information associated uh, to uh, the, the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, we can immediately make uh, just a plot of this, uh, uh, of the shape of the polygons uh, by using the plot function, exactly as we did for, for pandas. Here for, for geopandas, uh, we can uh, uh, easily uh, just use the plot function. Once we have read the shape file into the, the, the object uh, USA, we can just make a plot of this, and, and here immediately you will see that uh, a map appears uh, with uh, with the United States. Uh, the range is, is is big because I mean all type of uh, also non continental parts of the United States are included into into the map, uh, so territories uh, etc. Here, 
and, and and as you can see here we can also access this this file i mean this this object uh, uh, which is a, a geo data frame as it as it was uh, a data frame a pandas data frame for instance by using uh, the function head that will uh, return us the first uh, five uh, rows of the of the of the tabular data of the database associated to to the data frame and so here we can see that uh, each line is actually a polygon uh, uh, that is characterized by certain features uh, here for instance at the top we have uh, uh, first five polygons that belong to alaska uh, the uh, geometric the spatial information is uh, uh, contained into this column uh, that is called the geometry while here on the other columns we have information that is uh, uh, basically information about the administrative uh, um, characteristics of, of this polygon so what is the region they belong to and and other features so actually this is uh, a standard uh, uh, data frame uh, as is in pandas and, and can be manipulated uh, by all using all the standard functions of pandas uh, and for instance we can select uh, uh, among the United States uh, of, of this uh, of this polygon, only the continental part of the United States, and uh, and uh, one thing or, or one way of doing this is just by uh, yeah selecting uh, rows as uh, as we we would do in uh, in pandas. So basically, here I'm making a selection. I'm I'm, I'm taking from this table USA uh, all uh, the rows. Where the name is not Alaska, is not away, and it's not Puerto Rico, and by by uh, by this condition here, uh, I can just uh, uh, take the uh, U.S. count, and here I'm just going to first uh, maybe plot it, and and here we see that we have just uh, removed uh, the non-continental part of the United States. And here we have a map of the United States. Uh, in in uh, in this map, uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, uh, we have polygons. So we can, uh, sorry about that. We can uh, just uh, show individual parts. Um, okay, we don't have like ten. Sorry. So, yeah. So. Here we have like states, and uh, yeah, we start from yeah, we start from uh, eighty one actually. So this was this is why it didn't work before. So U.S. count. So here we have um, one hundred and fifty rows. So one hundred and fifty rows, of course, because there are more polygons there is more than one polygon for each of the of the states right so we have like uh, um, islands like in florida there are several several polygons that belong to to florida because there are different islands different uh, uh, small pieces in other cases uh, like for instance uh, the, the main part of minnesota is just one polygon and then we can access uh, the single geometry of, of each polygon by just using uh, uh, the function, uh, uh, the, the location function. Uh, so by localizing and, and showing the geometry of the polygon uh, in uh, in this specific case. Um, so here you can see basically how this is a collection. So this this uh, geo data frame uh, uh, is a collection of different uh, different polygons. And uh, one important thing that uh, is always important to keep in mind when you deal uh, when you work with uh, um, with geospatial data, uh, and uh, it's it's the fact that uh, each uh, data set always comes uh, in a specific uh, coordinate uh, reference system. So when you have uh, uh, some data set with the spatial information associated with it, uh, whether it's a polygon or it's a collection of polygons or points, uh, uh, they always come with some uh, um, definition of, of, of coordinate reference system. Because of course, this is uh, always needed when you need to, uh, uh, to, to plot, to represent uh, uh, what, what is on a sphere, that is the Earth, on, uh, um, on, the, uh, on, 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 uh, on, on a plane. And uh, uh, basically, um, uh, 
we, you can always access with GeoPandas uh, the coordinate reference system uh, associated to a specific uh, uh, file. And here, for instance, uh, uh, so this is the format of a coordinate reference system. So uh, I will not go into much details on explaining all the type of coordinate reference system uh, and the nomenclature behind it. Uh, what, what is important to know is that uh, you can always uh, transform one uh, spatial object from one coordinate reference system to another uh, by uh, using a function uh, of GeoPandas that is uh, to CRS. And, and of course, if, if, you, if, it comes that, if it happens that you have different uh, spatial data sets that are defined with different coordinate reference systems, then you will need to uh, create a common one, right? To uh, basically uh, set uh, the same coordinate reference system for all the files that you are, uh, all the data sets that you are considering uh, uh, in order to make appropriate uh, uh, matching between the different, the different files. So for instance, here, the, the file that I've just uploaded, the shape file, um, uh, the USA uh, continental uh, part of the United States, uh, uh, comes with this uh, coordinate reference system that is uh, defined uh, in, in GeoPandas by a dictionary. The key is always the init, and then we have a code uh, that is uh, so called a PSG code. Uh, there is a, a, a long definition of different reference systems. Uh, this one uh, is, the, is the standard one, um, is the Mercator uh, uh, coordinate reference system. Uh, but uh, as you may notice, actually may have noticed that uh, typically in the United States, uh, the, the map of the United States that is shown uh, in, um, in most of the, of the papers, uh, books, and also on TV, typically does not look like this. I mean, uh, uh, the, there is the, 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 the map of when, when you see maps of the United States uh, uh, in uh, shown in, uh, in, uh, in, in books or papers, they have, a, there is, they have a different shape. And this is because they, the, they use a different, uh, there is a different coordinate systems, reference systems, uh, and uh, um, which is this one, um, the, the so-called uh, uh, Arbert uh, conic area, where, and, and which is defined in, with this specific code that of course you need to, to look for if you want to use it. And then we can basically transform the, the shape file uh, move it from one coordinate reference system to another. Uh, as you can see, basically, uh, the definition uh, of, of the rows uh, after this change uh, of, of reference system have not changed. Uh, but what has changed is the geometry. So while here, the geometry was defined uh, with the, uh, the usual uh, latitude and longitude uh, values, uh, here, the, the, the values have changed because we have, we have changed the, the, the geometry of the reference systems uh, and we have moved into a, a, a metric one. So basically, uh, here we can now plot it again and here we recover, we find the, the shape of the United States as they typically uh, look like when, when we when we see them on, uh, on, uh, on maps and on books uh, with the different uh, uh, coordinate reference system. And here you can see that uh, the, the values of latitude and longitude have been changed uh, into numbers that actually represent uh, a distance in, uh, in, uh, in miles. Um, we move then to another example uh, that is an example of London. Uh, so for London, uh, also there is several uh, uh, shape files that are um, uh, uploaded, have been uploaded into the, the folder that I'm, I'm sharing with you. Uh, London is another uh, example uh, where there is a lot of uh, lots of publicly available data uh, of geospatial data that is, is publicly available. Uh, typically, you can find shape files for uh, uh, all the regions of the world, actually. So uh, the, 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 common, the format is, is very, very common. If you look for shape files of different countries, uh, different administrative units, uh, uh, you will find a lot of resources uh, uh, online. Uh, in the case of the UK and of London specifically, the, there are many of, of these resources, uh, uh, but I mean, this is also true uh, 
for, uh, for the rest of the world. There are databases uh, where you can find the shape files uh, for uh, uh, all type of, uh, uh, of applications uh, uh, with uh, different resolution levels. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I mean, if you are looking for, for, your, uh, for your projects uh, to, for a specific uh, shape file uh, and, and you cannot find it, just uh, uh, feel free uh, to, to, to get in touch uh, and I can uh, uh, maybe help you with uh, some uh, directions here. Uh, here in this case, uh, uh, we are loading uh, a shape file uh, of, uh, of the uh, so-called MSOA of London, which are um, uh, small administrative uh, units uh, of, of the London, of the city of London. Uh, and, uh, and basically, again, uh, uh, we can read the shape file just with the functional read files and see uh, what is the, um, the content of, the, of, of this uh, uh, shape file. But basically, each line uh, corresponds to one uh, uh, MSOA. And then we see that there are also several other uh, information uh, and feature associated to, uh, to each administrative unit. And these are typical information that you can find in, uh, in the census data. So the shape files, uh, shape file comes with the, um, uh, information about uh, uh, the number of people who live in a certain place. Uh, the, uh, for instance, here we have a column uh, usual residents, uh, the number of households, the average household size in this case, uh, the percentage of population um, recognize themselves as, as white. Um, there are other uh, percentage of households with, uh, uh, with couples, uh, and then also a, a, Z, a Z score of, of crime levels. So in this case, we have a, a ship file with uh, not only that on, not only contains uh, the geographic, the geometry of the uh, of these uh, administrative divisions of London, but as, as often uh, uh, happens in, in reality, other uh, social demographic and socioeconomic uh, features. Um, and then we will see how, of course, how to display this, uh, how to plot them. Uh, again, we can check the coordinate reference system of this ship file, which is again another one is different from the the ones that we've seen before, because um, again, for London, uh, uh, for the specific area of London, the, the, this is the most commonly used. Uh, we can plot it, and then we can see um, uh, how it how it looks like. Uh, okay, we recognize the shape of the of the city uh, in just with a simple plot. Uh, this can probably is not the most uh, aesthetically pleasant, but uh, uh, it's it's very quick uh, way to 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 see it. Uh, again, here we can see the inspect the geometry of, uh, of a single administrative unit. And uh, not only polygons we can, uh, we can analyze with, uh, uh, with GeoPandas, uh, but for instance, lines. So lines uh, are uh, um, objects that are, can be displayed as, as polygons. Um, uh, and for instance, uh, one type of line that, that we can uh, display on, on London is the, the, the tube lines in, in the city of London, uh, which are uh, saved in this uh, shape file called the tube lines, uh, tube lines .shp. Uh, Again, uh, we just load it with the red file, read file uh, function. Uh, the coordinate reference system uh, is the same as uh, the one of the London here uh, of, of the administrative unit. So we have this uh, APSG 27700. Uh, so basically this tells us that we can uh, uh, visualize uh, both data sets, uh, one on top of, of, the other, of each other. Uh, we can again make a plot, a simple plot. Uh, and finally, the last uh, type of uh, um, uh, object or spatial object that we can uh, uh, visualize with Geopandas uh, are points. Uh, points uh, uh, follow a similar structure again uh, and uh, uh, we here in the in the folder have a, 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 have put a shape file that is called uh, uh, OSM uh, Poise London, which basically stands for points of interest collected from OpenStreetMap in the city of London. So OpenStreetMap is a is a very powerful resource 
for to collect just partial georeferenced information. Uh, and uh, there is a, a public API to OpenStreetMap. It's a collaborative system uh, to uh, map uh, areas. And, uh, and especially of interest is the fact that uh, you can download automatically from the APIs, for instance, uh, different uh, points of interest. And here uh, in this shape file that we read here, uh, there are basically all, all types of points of interest uh, in, the, in the city. We, we can just plot it. Uh, the points of interest that are supported by, by OpenStreetMap. Uh, you can see there is a blob of, of points. Uh, just a check here, you can see that the shape is a bit different because the coordinate reference system is not the same used in the other two. Uh, this comes from uh, OpenStreetMap, but again, it's easy to, to basically translate one to the other one by, by, by just using the function to CRS and by uh, switching um, coordinate reference system. Uh, and then at this point, we can inspect the type of points of interest that uh, are present in the data set. Uh, here, maybe first we can take a look uh, at uh, what's inside the, the object. So here, uh, the data frame here, you can see that basically we have an ID of the uh, of, course of, of OpenStreetMap, a code for the point of interest, the type of point of interest. We have many, uh, the F class, the name of the point of interest and the geometry. The geometry will be uh, the exact location uh, in latitude and longitude, but now it's changed due to the change, uh, due to the change of the coordinate reference system. And here we can inspect a number of different types of, of point of interest. Uh, and there are unique values for this F class. And you can see there are many from uh, uh, pub, uh, bicycle rent rat, uh, hotel, laundry, courthouse, university, um, outdoor shop, computer shop. Uh, let's say we take an interesting uh, type of point of interest, it is pubs. Uh, we can just select all those that are uh, pubs in our data set. Uh, there are a uh, bit more than 2,000 pubs in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in London here. And we can just uh, uh, plot it again. Uh, and uh, now what we can think is to create one plot, one single map that uh, uh, shows together all the different layers that we have uh, that we have inspected uh, so far. So um, on, this, uh, uh, on this map, we'll first uh, create a map showing uh, the uh, MSOAs, so the, the administrative units of, of Greater London. And to do so, we basically uh, create uh, with, uh, uh, with um, uh, matplotlib, uh, this uh, figure. So first we set up with this function, we set up the, the figure uh, with the sides in inches of the figure. Uh, we say there is only, here we state there is only one subplot. So it's only one, uh, one plot, but we could also could make more than, than one if needed. Uh, and then uh, uh, we also set the DPI, so a, a resolution level. Then we uh, remove the axis frames. So just to, to have a map here. And then we plot the, uh, the administrative unit with the function plot uh, by adding a few more information like uh, the, the, the width of the, of, of the lines indicating the uh, separating the administrative units, the face color, the edge color. We also set alpha that provides a level of uh, uh, transparency. Then we set the title and then we, we show the, the map. And here, okay, I'm running it again. You see already the result here, and we have a nice map of all the uh, administrative unit of Greater London with uh, with a title on top, uh, with uh, with a few lines of, of codes. Uh, if we want to add more layers, as I said, we would like to to create uh, uh, a visualization a visualization that includes more more layers. Uh, basically, what we need is just to plot one uh, shape file, one uh, geo data frame, uh, one after the other one. So we just set up uh, the same type of figure here with uh, with uh, pyplot uh, matplotlib subplots. 
Again, we remove the frames and then we plot the first uh, the, uh, the, the administrative units. Then uh, we plot the London tube in, uh, in red with a different level of uh, alpha, which is again a transparency. Alpha zero means completely transparent and alpha one means a full, uh, uh, full color. And then we plot uh, the London pubs uh, uh, at, uh, on top of everything in blue. With the, uh, with the marker size one. So this defines the level of, of the marker. Maybe we can make it a bit, a bit bigger. And then we, we again, we, we set the title uh, for the plot here. And then here we see, and we can inspect the, the map. And here we have a map of Greater London where you can see the tube lines. And then we can also well notice that pubs tend to actually uh, align with the with the with the tube lines, right? So we can we can see uh, from uh, from the map that there is a, a certain uh, uh, proximity between uh, between where pubs are located and at least a certain tube lines of, of the of the Greater London area. Uh, of course, we can also uh, uh, increase the level uh, uh, of the aesthetics of, of the plot by changing uh, uh, colors and palettes. Uh, and actually, the choice of colors can influence uh, the, the effectiveness of a map. Uh, here, I mean, uh, one, one, uh, one nice thing is that with, uh, with Matplotlib, with Seaborn and, uh, and other libraries, uh, uh, we can create uh, specific palettes to, to, um, to visualize our, our data. Uh, here, in this case, we use a library called uh, Palettable uh, can, that allows to uh, uh, create, uh, uh, to, to import uh, uh, a various range of, uh, of color palette. One nice thing, nice thing for instance, is to, to use uh, uh, this color palette from the uh, Wes Anderson movies, uh, uh, Their Jailing Limited. And, uh, and now basically this palette is actually uh, just a list of, uh, of colors uh, uh, defined in, uh, in their hexadecimal uh, standards. And, uh, and basically uh, what I'm doing here is to redo the plot uh, we have seen before just changing the colors uh, uh, using the, the colors from, from this palette uh, of colors. So we can pass uh, to the function uh, face color and the edge color of this different GeoPandas uh, data frame, uh, the different colors of the palette. And then we can, uh, we can see uh, how the results changed. And, and of course you can choose uh, from many different colors in, in Python here. This is just an example. Um, and finally, uh, of course, uh, uh, very, very important. Uh, uh, you, you often you want to save uh, uh, maps uh, to, to figures uh, and not, not only see them on your notebook. Uh, and so uh, one, one way of doing this is just uh, create the exact figure as before and then save it uh, here as a file. You can save it in all formats uh, you, you may think of. Uh, of course, the, the most common ones, JPEG and PNG, uh, you can make it uh, well, 500 DPI is maybe too much, but like a 300 is already quite good. And then save it as a, as a file that then you can export and use it for, for one of your presentations. And the last argument, the last topic uh, here is that I wanted to touch is uh, the, um, uh, the creation of maps uh, that are very common in the social sciences uh, and that are choroplets map. So a choroplet uh, uh, is, uh, is a map that assign a different color uh, to values uh, that are present uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a map, in a polygon uh, map. Uh, and uh, uh, in uh, using GeoPandas, it's very, very easy to, to create uh, um, to create a choroplet. First of all, we can create a, an easy choroplet just basically on a categorical variables. Uh, for instance, uh, we take again the, um, the administrative units of London and we look uh, at where uh, the majority race, uh, so the, the most of 50% uh, of, uh, of the population identify themselves as, as white. Uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, 
so here we have created uh, this uh, um, this new variable here that is either uh, white or other so it's it's categorical clearly so we have only two two values allowed and uh, and here uh, we can just uh, uh, plot this uh, by basically saying that we want to plot uh, the administrative units again at the shape file uh, the, of the MSOS, uh, where we want to plot a specific column value. Right. So if we pass the column value of the of the GeoPandas uh, of the GeoData frame, um, we will see that. Uh, uh, and here, sorry, I will just uh, to avoid confusion, we will see that it will interpret uh, the, the the values uh, with this categorical true uh, automatically. So we will it will assign two uh, different uh, uh, values uh, to uh, to the two um, to the two uh, categories, and uh, and then. Uh, it creates automatically our our plot, our map, uh, and of course, I mean we can also uh, uh, we can also plot uh, um, quantities that are not categorical. Um, well, one other thing, yeah, something to note is that legend true means that we will show the legend here, and again categorical true because it, we need to to tell them. Uh, uh, but then, of course, we can plot another uh, non-categorical variable. Let's say we want to uh, plot uh, um, something uh, something different. Uh, that it's uh, uh, sorry, MSOS London. Uh, then, then uh, it is present here. Um, for instance, uh, this this variable is uh, average household size. Um, and then here we just need to plot this. Uh, again, we we can just recreate the, the the plot. Basically, it's the same plot, uh, but again we change the column. It's not categorical anymore. The household size varies from about zero point five to almost four. And here again we can see how larger households tend to. To live in this area, while uh, uh, in the city, uh, in the very, very center of, of London, uh, the the house size values, uh, the average house size is the minimum, and and so basically we have a, a clear pattern of uh, uh, center to periphery difference in this in these quantities. So here again we look at the, this part of the code. Uh, the, the the figure is always uh, defined uh, in the same way. I remove the axis. Uh, I'm, I'm telling the, the plot function that is going to happen on, on take on, on the x-axis defined here. Uh, the column is this one. Uh, we have defined the edge of the of the of the single polygons in white with a, a 0.1 line width, and the legend is true. And legend true means that uh, we'll show this color bar here next to uh, to the map. Okay, so I'm at the end of the also of this notebook. Um, I took uh, quite some more time than uh, maybe I expected, but I mean I think uh, in the end we are we are uh, um, in time for for the rest of the to to conclude the the lecture. So I'm. Um,